par ici. Robert Lynn Nelson created what they call the two worlds, the undersea, which usually in most of his paintings, two thirds of it takes place undersea, and one third is above. Mm -hmm. Then he went to three worlds. But now in this one, as you see, this is this is a rainforest and on the bottom, you know, paradise beach, the undersea, which is his milieu, you know, his, his thing. And he even has the waves coming off the shore in this instance, you know, which is kind of interesting. The, 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 brain, uh, the ring of sea life, ring of dolphins and whales, you know, which I think is pretty neat. The rainbow, there's a little windsurfer over there with a Shanti sign, uh, which is a Sanskrit symbol for mm -hmm. peace mm -hmm. on, on, the, the, uh, on the sail. And of course the American flag and the fireworks symbolizing America on the 4th of July, you know. And Cosmos, so he's got this... There's a lot to read in this stuff. There is yeah, plenty. And, and was general. commissioned for the album? Yeah, see I went to Robert Lennon Nelson about a year ago I said, look, we're going to be we're working for the next several months on an album. What I think, rather than going the usual route, which is to get a person in the art department of a record company to come up with something just to satisfy the, mm -hmm. the, the packaging needs, I thought it'd be, it raises raise our the visual appreciation, you know, uh, level to a whole new it's not a whole new level, you know. Let's get into the record. You know, um, Summer, it's your first uh, official full album <coughs> of, of new material since 1985. For, it's been seven years. For, yeah, actually, right. Which is a long time. Too long, actually, for a new Beach Boys album. Well, it is too long. You're right. What but took so there, long? Well, what took so long is the group has, for the past several years, been sort of uh, coasting on the momentum of the the pillars of of our success, which are the sick in the '60s, sure. um, and uh, we got a little bit uh, excited by Kokomo, I would say, because it was the largest selling single of our careers and largest selling single of the year. As a matter of fact, the only one that uh, surpassed it was Wild Thing, which came along later in the late in the year and may may have may not even calculate in 1988, but for but it was the top-selling single, and uh, and it was responsible for several million sales on the cocktail album. And uh, you know, we have a letter from Disney to the effect that the Kokomo was the driving force in the album. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was the number one video on VH1 and, and Nickelodeon, and you know, the Jukebox Operators Award. Unfortunately, because Tracy Chapman and Anita Baker were on Elektra Records, Elektra did not submit it for the recognition at the Grammys of single, single of the Year uh, because of politics, uh, you know, that which is a, a shortcoming, I think, and it's a flaw in the in the system. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but at any rate, uh, we're very, you know, uh, delighted. That that happened. That was a collaboration by, between John Phillips, who came up with the verse, the first, the verse and the verse melody, was John Phillips. I came up with the Aruba Jamaica chorus, and Terry Melcher came came up with the well, I want to take you down to Kokomo, we'll get there fast, and take it slow. That's where you want to go down Kokomo. Now Terry's so producing the record or produced the record. He he co-wrote and produced the record. And Terry's background, you probably know, is the Birds and Paul Revere and the Raiders, and at one time Bruce and Terry, mm -hmm. and the Rip Chords. So he 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 he's eminently suited. He's, he's of all the people that I know, uh, or even know of, he's the most uh, eminently qualified to position our group vocally. Yeah. In our in our best strengths. How and would you describe the tone of the record? I understand it's kind of a back to the which? roots of the new record, the, Summer the, in Paradise. The, the, the album itself. Yeah, the album. The album. We to, to tell you about the album. I think we should start out with the concept. Okay. Uh, the concept. Uh, I I I go back to Beach Boy Party album and Pet Sounds. Not so much qualitatively, but to 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 to, to draw a parallel. In 1966, the, Capitol Records was um, chomping at the bit for uh, for uh, an album, mm -hmm. and Brian Wilson wanted to spend 
a lot of time creating this this uh, piece of work, which uh, which we know as Pet Sounds. And he was feeling the time constraints. He really wanted to take more time to develop it than than. And, and yet the record company was saying, we want an album, we want an album. So what we did is we went in and recorded in just two sessions, two back-to-back, -back, two sessions, one day after the next, uh, the Beach Boys Party album. And on that, we sang Barbara Ann, which we had no idea of it ever being a single. In fact, this was just to give the record company an album to get them off our backs. And the, the, the Al Corey, who was late, then... A, East Coast, well, Northeastern promotion man for Capitol Records, who became the head of promotion for Capitol Records, uh, was passed over as president, went to RSO, became president of RSO during Greece and Saturday Night Fever days, and then more recently he's over at Geffen. He he actually chose Barbara Ann up then and went to number one. Fine, bought some time. Then Pet Sounds came out a few, few months later, and... Um, <clears throat> At any rate, what we wanted to do is we wanted to get together and record uh, something very masterful. In fact, I already have this, the title of our next album. Um, but we, we wanted, but to, in order to do the kind of album that I think is is would be appropriate for the Beach Boys to do to make a real statement about life and, you know, all the issues that, that, that are important to us now, as opposed to 1962 and 3. Right. Uh, we, we thought, well, we're going to need some time, just like we did with Pet Sounds, mm -hmm. only not just a year, maybe a couple of years of latitude and time to develop the songs and produce them properly and, you know, that kind of thing. So what we did is we set out to, to do the definitive soundtrack of summer by the sultans of summer themselves. You know who. <laughs> okay, so that's what the, 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 the premise for this album was. And, and Terry Melcher and I met and we went over 30 songs, you know, Summer in the City, Summertime by the Jamies, um, in the summertime, Mungo, Jerry, and you know, we went over everything there possibly was. One of my favorites is uh, Wonderful Summer by Robin Ward. I tried to get these guys to do it, but Bruce Johnson and, and Terry Melcher do it, but you got to understand, Terry for a while was a member of Rotary, and that, that you know, Rotarians do not think romantically. <laughs> you know, middle-aged producers who happen to be rot in Rotary do not think romantically like a 17-year-old girl. I, I remind, I remi I'd have to remind these guys that we are of an age that remember, you know, in the remote history of your life when there was a thing called romance, and <laughs> girls like romance. They like a slow dance once in a while. Sure. So, I mean, we've, we've, we've uh, done our, we, we've settled upon what we felt was the most appropriate uh, were the most appropriate covers for this project, and through process of elimination and, and growth and expansion of the concept, it went from simply the definition of summer to a few few other songs, uh, particularly the original songs that would encompass uh, that would be appropriate at other times a year. Uh, so we have a song called Island Fever, which resonates well with the summer songs but it's it's meant to come out in the winter you know when when people are you when know, you want to get away something. exactly it's it's sort of like the the cousin to kokomo hmm. you know musically speaking mm -hmm. and uh but we did do walking in the sand which i think is awesome on the hot, record we'll be yeah, on the record. hot fun in the summertime is the first single mm -hmm. and it will be released it's going to go out to radio next week uh, and the the video will probably be, we're going to we're shooting for July fourth weekend. For oh, the video. Wow. You know, um, Maria told me that the record is if it's not going to be released through a major label. What's right. where will the record? Are you guys playing at? Will be go through an independent distributor? How? Well, that, that's an do? interesting story. You see, the Beach Boys have been on Capitol Records, yeah. Warner's, CBS, back to Capitol, and in the case of Kokomo, was on Electra. Electra. Mm -hmm. 
So we've been we've been distributing our, our records through major labels all our career, you know, yeah. all our lives, except for our first record, Surfing, which was on a label called Candex, which went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we got a total of $900 for the royalties on that one. Uh, but then we signed with Capital in 1962, and, and we were with them for several years. But the problem with the major is, just as recently as the Still Cruising album, which preceded this project, was that the same week that we went to radio with with a song called Somewhere Near Japan, mm -hmm. which is getting really good airplay. Uh, good and, and, yeah, it's yeah, a great yeah. song. And we worked our ass off on it, as a collective hindquarters off, mm -hmm. on, on getting it, yeah. it uh, to where we thought it was a, a great piece of work musically. And uh, Capitol Records in the same week went to CHR radio stations with, um, well, they had they had something like eight singles they were going out with, just one label that week, and so there was no. They'd also just just done a deal with uh, uh, the guys from Australia. Um, not Midnight Oil. Not Midnight Oil. Not not. Air Supply. No, not them. In excess. No. Nope. Wow. The other ones. The other. <laughs> you know the ones that are they are on the ship. And the, the, uh, they had a video on a, a boat, I think. What the hell is that group? It's a big group. I mean, it's a huge yeah. group. Duran Duran, I think. Oh, okay. okay. Sure. I think they'd done a deal with yeah, Duran Duran. Duran. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so they had paid a lot of money for Duran Duran, whereas we did a, an album of half new and half, yeah, you know, older songs. Uh, the theme of that album was was to have been uh, songs that have been in movies. Mm -hmm. It was basically a repackage. Right. And, and some of the, you know, being Kokomo and it being a relevant one, and there was uh, a couple others on there. But then it got watered down a bit by politics, meaning Brian's uh, Dr. Landy mm -hmm. forcing a song called In My Car on there, which was n never in a movie. And, and a, a song by Jardine, which, which ultimately ended up on the album called Island Girl, which is never in a movie either. So, the, to me, the, the concept was a little bit diluted, therefore, politically. Yeah. And the, the, so what happened is, in, that, in this instance, I was not happy with, with the fact that the album was half repackaged and half politics. Because what happens if you do things politically just to accommodate the fact that if you're in a group, okay, and everybody, you divide it by five members and you got two songs each, it may be a political and a, and a nice thing to do and, and a, an accommodation, but it may not, but, yeah. but, 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 but everybody has their own point of view, their mm -hmm. own strengths and weaknesses yeah. that, aren't, that aren't taken into consideration objectively. So what I what I said is uh, I asked the group and got approval for the the uh, the authorization for me to take a hand in in the next album project which is Summer in Paradox. And that every song and whatever producer we would use would have to be okayed by me mm -hmm. and then I could, I would have uh, the, the authority uh, to to exercise what I felt was m m the most commercial and creative strengths of all the guys because uh, we were I was objective enough along with Terry Melcher to create Kokomo. Mm -hmm. There have been other things that have been less successful that we've done. However, that was one where I took a, a, a real strong hand in the writing and co-writing right. and. And, and actually got it, went over and got it placed in the movie. I went out mm -hmm. to meet the director and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So what I wanted to do is have the opportunity to do a project where we could make lightning strike twice, hopefully, mm -hmm. and do something that I felt was, A, commercially viable and acceptable to the mindset of people there who are out there who are our core fans. So 
the idea for a summer thematic album appealed to me because A, a lot of songs have been done already that are great songs that we would sound good doing. Hot Fun in the Summertime, I don't know if you've heard it, but... No. But Marie said you might play it for us. Do you, do you have something you could play yeah, for us? Here with me. I have it in the room. I have it here. Yeah. I, can go, hear. I can go up and get it. Yeah, at some point we'd, we'd love, love to hear it. Yeah. Anyway, so Hot Fun in the Summertime, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the original, but... Yeah. But by the Beach Boys, it's, it's phenomenal. It's just it sounds like the Beach Boys wow. made it. You know, yeah. hot. Uh, uh, remember walking the sand. This Carl sounds so good on it, and the arrangement is so hot. It's just mm -hmm. a mind blower. We did another one called Under the Boardwalk, which is a mind blower. Nice. Everybody that hears that loves it. Now I understand I mean, you did uh, do a cover of one of your own songs, Surfing. Maybe to get back right. more than the nine hundred dollars royalties. <laughs> oh, easily, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was fun. In fact, listening to it, playing it back, blows my mind because it. We we it's approach it from the sound standpoint of okay, what would it be like if we started out in the nineties, in ninety two? What would it be like if we recorded a song in ninety two? So it's got the hip hop drums, really? it's got the metalish guitar, you know, and our in our sound, and it's very. You know, it's got a. A rap form. It's got, got up this morning, turned on my radio. Boom, 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 boom. Really? Boom. Yeah. So it's, it's not rap, but it's a rap form mm -hmm. and structure and sonic somewhat. So this you is know? like so an it's almost urban. A, it's got a. It's an urban, urbanized surfing. It's like a '90s Beach Boys album with elements of what was good in the '60s. Yeah. I guess. The vocals. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and so. And we've got the most modern, up-to-date, beyond up-to-date technology to do this thing. It's, uh, we're recording it right onto a hard disk, this Pro Tools equipment, and it's just wow. phenomenal. It's not even on tape. You know, uh, this you is know. a question I wanted to ask you. You've been writing songs for, God, probably 30 years, 30 years now. Do you find it easier or more difficult to pull the rabbit out of the hat and really please yourself? Are your standards that much higher, or is it just the process of writing? Well, is, when I write a song, I mean, like for instance, "Summer in Paradise" okay. was the last song we that I did the lyrics on. It's because I wanted to osmose a lot, you know. "Summer in Paradise" is like uh, it starts out saying, "Way back when, when our master plan was having fun, fun, fun as America's band, we came out rocking with Rhonda and Barbara Ann." Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's, um, it's something about. Um, Something about it could be the lifestyle that we had could be over, and it sure is sad, you know, mm -hmm. to think about that. And the point is that, the, the, you know, like, like there's uh, too much consumption and too much greed when you consider all the people who are living in need, and, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a, a social statement, an environmental statement, mm -hmm. but with we got to bring back summer. Give us back our summer. We got to bring back summer in paradise, right? The idea—it's not irretrievable, but it's—it's it's kind of dicey there. You know, you go out in the sun, you get sun, you know, you get blinded by the ultraviolet rays, or there goes the photoplankton. You know, how many species are going to be gone within the next 20 or 30 years? How many are already gone? I mean, it's—it's it's disgusting. You know, medical waste closes the beaches, and and you know, uh, I mean, it's just. It's a nightmare that the politicians won't admit to, and George Bush wants to keep the emissions levels at the current levels, which is what's fucked up. There's sheep are going blind in New Zealand, you know. I mean, because the the uh, ozone layer is is kaput down there. So you know, all these things bother me, and, and I'm not. We've never been known for you know political or uh, political statements per se. Although it's philosophical, that's another story. I think you know. Our basic premise of having a good time in life is philosophical, and we've touched upon some spiritual messages in our songs from time to time. Yeah. But this, the, the, you know, in addition to having fun in the summer and, and hot fun and and walking in the sand and under the boardwalk, a little romance. This song called "One Summer Night," which we retooled, did a new verse to, and the chorus is the "One Summer Night" R and B. Uh, hit of like the 50s and it sounds neat but then we have like I said Island Fever which is kind of like a, a get away from it all type sort of like Kokomo and, but then Summer in Paradise deals with 
the issue at hand, which is survival. <laughs> and survival, not just, you know, so you don't have to wear a, a spacesuit to go to the beach, you know, sure. but to try to get things, act together to make things uh, better. That brings up the point I was going to talk to you about. You just got back from the real Earth Summit. Mm -hmm. I guess all the guys were there for that. And um, even though you mentioned the Beach Boys really hadn't dealt with some issues like that, I mean, going back to Surf Stop, Don't Go Near the Water, you guys yeah. really did. 1972, uh, Yeah, you guys really did. That's what I meant from time to time. time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and even going back to Friends, there are a lot of spiritual type things. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to ask you about if you could first talk about you guys contributed $100,000 for something pretty unique um, the video camera. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. I mean, I know what it's about, but for all the well, listeners. Well, a friend of ours uh, named Jan Harkey is head of an organization called Earthkind. Okay. So the Beach Boys um, uh, announced down at, 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 uh, at Rio to the press that we were going to contribute $100,000 towards funding uh, initiating a, a project called Eyewitness for the Earth. And the idea is to get video cameras into the hands of some of these non-governmental environmental organizations that are out there in the field, out there in the front lines, wherever they are, uh, with the first 25 cameras going to Brazil. And, and for their, yeah. So the idea being uh, uh, to, to actually put them in the hands of people so that they can be actual stories coming back mm -hmm, right. that we would then try to process and evaluate and present to uh, mm -hmm. relevant uh, news or documentary uh, people. And so that is a uh, pet project that developed or uh, conceived by Jan Hartke of Earthkind, which is a division of the Humane Society. Right. And we just felt like that was uh, something we could do to help support and start start and so that that was just one thing that we did the the main the main purpose of our visit to Rio was to go and see what was up and learn obviously we weren't part of the the United Nations mm -hmm. part of it we were part of what they call we went and visited what they call the global forum which is hundreds of exhibits from people all over the world right. that had all these great inventions and wow. proposals and <laughs> displays and and you know it was it was awesome it was you know there there must have been there were thousands of people there for that and it gave us a lot of ideas and a lot of respect for those people who have committed their livelihoods and their lives to to uh, to the uh, you know trying to do something to better the earth there's a great quote I wanted to, to read to you that Spencer Beebe the president of EcoTrust mentioned and it's kind of like I mean, he was saying, you know, everyone can really do something. It's not just money. He said, saving the planet. I th thought it was a great quote. Saving the planet has never been an issue of money, rather a matter of resourcefulness and motivation of individuals. That right. A lot of times people, and I feel this way sometimes, you feel like one person can't get it done. But, I mean, one mm -hmm. person can start the ball rolling and mm -hmm. people unite, you know, for that. That's right. And that's, that's the premise of the, our title song for the album called Summer in Paradise. And the painting is to say this is this is what life can be. I mean, the the, the beauty and the, the richness, the diversity of nature, the idyllic, uh, um, what heightened reality of it all is one thing. But it's meant to give you a visual impression of the precious nature of life, and that we shouldn't just trash it. And that summer in paradise is we all got to get together. The, the last line of the song goes, there's trouble now, but it'll be all right if we can bring back summer in paradise. Now, who will be putting out the record? Will it be on a beat? What label would it be? Beach Boys well, label? Or what's the deal with that? Um, well, we're, right now we're, we're creating a new label for, for the distribution of this. It's being distributed by a company called Navarre, N-A-V-A-R-R-E, which is a national independent distribution company. Okay. So they will actually, because CDs and cassettes are so compact these days, it's very easy just to UPS, if, if, a, if you're a store in Omaha and you want, you know, 
uh, 50 new Beach Boy albums, boom, they're there in a day or two, you know, right. next day delivery, done. So it's very, uh, then they have their own dis field people uh, uh, oh. around the country in different areas, you know, at West Coast and South and North and Northeast and all this. They're located, Navarre is located in, in, uh, in Minneapolis. How what's, we the, met what's the label going to be called? Do you know? Have you guys determined what your label is <clears throat> called? Well, it might be Brother Entertainment Group. Oh, cool. Or it might be, or there's a couple of different names we're clearing in the process okay. of clearing right now, which is why I'm kind of vague on it, because yeah, sure. I don't want to say one thing and right. be another uh, for the purpose of the interview, but we're sure. clearing a couple of different names right now. That's a good name. Yeah, and w the reason, uh, I touched on briefly the reason why we're going this direction, but one of the interesting things is... Uh, I, I was flying and I'm flying into Burbank, and I met a fellow at the airport who we know from the CBS days. His name is Ron Alexenberg. I know Ron Alexenberg. Yeah. Aegis, Aegis Records, right? That's Aegis right. Records. Yeah. Yeah. So Ron Alexenberg um, is is the head of he's he's heading up the promotion for us. Is he? Good, he has his good. own independent. I want to call him. Yeah. He's he's a he he's really. He loves this project. When I told him about this project, I said, look, we've got all these songs. We're, we're nearing completion on it. This is a couple months ago I met him at the Burbank Airport. And I was just flying in and just met him there. It was karmic or something. And I said, hey, Ron, what's happening? Hey, Mike, what's going on? He said, well, what's going on? I said, Check this out. And I showed him the painting, the photograph of the painting. And I said, this is the, 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 uh, the painting I had commissioned by Robert Lynn Nelson, this great artist. To, for the for the, uh, I mean, he gets one hundred and fifty thousand bucks per painting. You know, it's, wow. I mean, so yeah. for his new paintings, and so it's like quite an honor to have him. He's like honored that we're using it. We're honored that he's <laughs> That's like That's great. That's the out. best way. Yeah, it was phenomenal. Anyway, I showed him, showed Ron this stuff, and I told him about the album. He says, uh, and he said, well, who's who are you gonna who are you going to go to with this project? I said, well, we've been doing it on our own at Terry Melcher's house with all this fantastic equipment, and we don't know. Well, I was thinking of taking it over to Al Corey at uh, Geffen because he's an old friend, and I was thinking of uh, um, we could always go to C back to CBS or he says, or, you know, Warner's. I mean, Irv Azoff has a new company, Giant Records. Sure. Um, and he says, well, why don't you go somewhere where they need you, not where it would be nice to have you. Yeah. Where you're not a and priority. I, yeah. And, he, and I said, huh, that sounds fairly <laughs> logical, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, can, 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 so he, he introduces this guy, uh, Eric Paulson, who has his own company, Navarre. I even went up there uh, last week in to Minneapolis and met their field staff that they have for a uh, mini convention they had there, right. so um, they're all excited. Yeah, and the thing is about it is the 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 margin that we'll make by not being with the major. And see, Which we won't have to sue a record company for accounting because we'll be yeah. we're going to sue ourselves. Yeah. It's yeah. much yeah. more direct, yeah. you know. I can subpoena myself if I, if I'm unhappy. I think it's going to happen a lot more. What the Beach Boys are doing with other artists taking it, don't you think? With the well, way I it's think, going, I think. Given the success of this project by the Beach Boys, uh, like for instance, just economically, if we went back to Capitol Records and we got a million dollar advance, well, then the record would come out. By the time you calculate the money from overseas and here and there, it'd be it'd be a good year before you got an accounting, yeah. and then you then they it takes a while to get paid, too, doesn't it? Yeah, and sometimes you have to. They, they always try to cheat you. They all, every major company always tries to use your money and, and pay you as little as possible and drag it out as long as possible and charge you all kinds of packaging deductions for... Yeah, it, it's really fraught with uh, fraud. Fraught with fraud and, and, and interesting, uh, interesting uh, accounting anomalies. Did you ever read the book Hitman? Yeah, of course. I'm scared. I know a few people in that book. Yeah, of course. I mean, we all do. <laughs> I, I bet you know a lot more people, actually. Too, too well. Anyway, so knowing that, A, 
you're never going to be a priority other than when you're in the meeting with these people. Mm -hmm. And even then, they're thinking about their next meeting or the last mm -hmm. meeting they had or the, the, some fire they got to put out or they just gave so-and-so a $10 million deal. Mm -hmm. So your $1 million deal doesn't mean shit compared to re having to re recoup. Mm -hmm. them. So there's that aspect of it. And then the, the other aspect is the, the fun and games when it comes to getting paid. I didn't realize it was that tough. Yeah, so on this situation, we, we're going to be, every 60 days, we're going to get, get our money. Yeah, you know, I see that every time, um, for instance, I just did an interview with Roger Daughtry at Atlantic in New York, so mm -hmm. for that week, babe, we love you. We love you. We're pushing this out. Boom. Once he's out of there, another sucker comes in. They don't, nothing ha and I'm not saying that it's a slight because Atlantic is actually one of the it's better just, companies yeah, to deal with. Yeah, it's just the but nature of the beast. God, that must be so disappointing. When well, if, if you're signed to a label, you're an expense to the label. You're yeah. both their lifeblood, but you're also an expense. Sure. So they treat you as a predator almost, mm -hmm. not as a partner. You know, I was curious, you guys did a new version of Forever with John Stamos. That's right. It's on TV, and we all thought it was really good. Yeah, well, in fact, we'll maybe put out. this on the album. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Please yeah. do. Or a B-side, maybe, of a single. Yeah, Exactly what we want to do, be side of hot fun. Because yeah, Stamos cool. directed the video. We did the video down in Orlando just a week ago. How yeah, about that, the Forever video? Um, the Forever video was done in LA uh, prior to that. In fact, you know, it was on the early, uh, the Full House in early May. Right. We were on two episodes, Bruce and, I, mm -hmm. and Bruce and I and Carl did the backgrounds on, on, on Forever. Speaking of greedy record companies, let's talk briefly about Capital. Okay. Actually, the Capital's all right. Um, the two first CDs they did for the Beach Boys were the best things I've ever seen. Unfortunately, the Beatles got horrible treatment. Thank God the Beach Boys got great treatment. That's a switch. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's true. It's true. What, what were your thoughts on Were you happy with the care they took? Because it really did seem like they said, you know, the Beach Boys are America's greatest band. We have to treat them with respect. And it seemed like in that case they did. Were you happy with? There must have been a mistake yeah. at the label. <laughs> Good I've mistake. Never, I've no. never heard of respect being said in the same sentence uh, by any record I was company. assuming that. <laughs> what did you think of uh, what they did with the installment of CDs? Were you pleased? I don't even know. No, I don't know. Right. I'm ignorant. Have you seen them all, though, right? Have you, have you checked no. them all? You haven't seen them? Mm -mm. Are you serious? I'm very and the serious. bonus tracks and stuff? No, no. I don't know. Oh, my God. Hmm. Really? Do you find that amusing? or? Well, yeah. So I guess surprising, maybe just because, I guess, since you've lived it and did it, I guess it's hard, you know, to believe that somebody wouldn't have it. I, I know, it is. It is hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Man. Why I is that? Hard why, to believe too. why is it? Are you, is it that you why live those days? That? Or, yeah, why would that be? Why is that? I would have brought some CDs for you if we would have known that. Because I'm a Pisces? Is that a good answer? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer. As good as, as good as I can come up with. Wow. No, I... There is nothing that we can do to, to stop them from merchandising our records in the way they want to merchandise. Right. So we're at their mercy. So if they've done something that in the opinion of the caring public is, is, is well done, then I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. But, but having no recourse or no ability, no say-so... So I didn't realize you didn't have any input. I thought even though... We can have input yeah. if we care to have input. Like for instance, they were going to do a Best of the Beach Boys Volume 3 in 19 whatever the hell it was and I came in there and I said wait a second call it Endless Summer and instead of being volume 3 which sounds nauseating to me like, yeah. uh, like it, the third rung of the ladder yeah. of the hits yeah you know? exactly like, we'll give you the good stuff on volume 1 yeah. volume 2 now yeah. Endless Summer it has a whole other vibe and it was it was it sold several million copies just to that switch the title but then I'm a title guy anyway you know the packaging was, was strange, though. I could never figure out who was who, you know, in those beers. Oh, I know. It was awesome. It's like, 
Well, well, see, where's that's, Brian? That's the other thing. Where's Mike? I was, I was Is on that the, out there? It I was looks on the, like a, yeah. I was on the roof Jack. of, of uh, a roof of a of of little cottages in Rishikesh, India, when the Beatles and, uh, and and myself were there. Donovan, Mia Farrell. It was a teacher training course for people to learn to become teachers of transcendental meditation. And I was sitting on the roof one night talking to Paul McCartney, and he was basically saying that, Mike, you ought to take more care in your art in your album covers. Yeah, because you know we really didn't, you know, we really didn't get into it that much. We take a photo or let the let the company come up with some horrible art like Endless Summer, the cover. And I said, well, you know, Paul, we always sort of cared more about what went inside. You thought that was a pretty cool answer, actually. You know, because Paul McCartney is very clever. He figures all kinds of stuff out, and he's good and prolific and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I sort of did a John Lennon, how do you sleep at night without saying it in so many words, you know. You did? I got him, I thought. You got him? You know, I said, we sort of cared what went into this. In other words, if you listen, if you took a magnif magnifying glass out or an oral audio magnifier out and you listen to the <coughs> quality of the harmonies on a Beatles project and you listen to the quality of the harmony on a Beach Boys project, There'd be a big difference, sure. qualitatively, if I may say so, egotistically and objectively. I think, but but the, the you know I, I just we just took a lot more care about that stuff. Okay. Now it doesn't mean that we're we're more commercial or yeah. or better or anything. It's just that's that was our focus. I need you to solve a debate for me that we're debating about. I've always said and maybe I'm I don't take drugs, don't drink. Maybe I just have an active imagination, but when I look at the Friends cover, I see the Beatles in the clouds. Hmm. I see John. I see Paul. Well, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, you have to show it to me. I'll see what I you see. I wish I, I brought it along today. I, I wish I brought it. We should pick yeah. it up at a store. Yeah, we should run down the street. But I always and, and we got to play it backwards too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on 78, on a gramophone. Well, that was a curious. You know, I was going to ask you about um, the, the India experience because George just did something for the Maharishis. That's right, the Natural Law Party. Natural Law Party. What was it like to see George? And I wanted to ask you about your experiences. <coughs> There's great pictures of all you guys, you know, oh, yeah. in India. And I love oh, to see those pictures. It sounds like it was a, a magical experience, a real relaxing magical time. mystery tour. Yeah. What was it like for you? What, do you have fond recollections of oh, those yeah. times? Oh, yeah. Best, yeah. Yeah, actually, that was the high point of my life up until that time, of being in India with Maharishi. And, and it was it was neat, you know, having the Beatles there, too. It was very colorful, very, you know, I mean, it couldn't be anybody higher in the scale of, of uh, celebrity at that point in time, could there? I mean. And Mia Farrow had just left Frank, and so like all the photogs were, you know, the paparazzi were saying, "Gee, she left Frank for a guru," you know. And so there was all that popular attention focused on that spot at that time, sure. and uh, being there. Was, but the the best part about it was what Maurice was talking about, mm -hmm. and the formula for a world peace that the key to which lies. Uh, within every individual's grasp, uh, all they have to do is transcend or learn to meditate and and put themselves in tune with their environment, in tune with other people, in tune with themselves, and and exude more positive, good vibrations. So it, it was very logical to me, and 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 the, the technique itself is so simple that uh, the first meditation. When Maharishi taught us in December of 67 in Paris, I thought, this is so simple that everyone could learn it. And if everyone learned it, it would be a completely different world. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it's just logical deduction. Do you, you know? meditate every day? Yeah. have since December of 67. That's great. Do you have like a time that you do it? Do you do it in the morning? You do it in the morning. A, it's like a ritual. In the morning uh, before you start your day's activities and the evening, late afternoon, early evening. I remember back in the 70s, we had kind of a progressive teacher who taught us how to do it. And I mm. did it, and I just remember it was a great feeling. I remember it was 
not like you were asleep, but you were just, it yeah. was, you were still it's there, but you weren't there. It's a distinctively different right. level of consciousness. It's, it's waking, dreaming, and sleeping, and then there's this fourth major state of consciousness, unlike the others metabolically. I mean, your, your, your metabolism goes to a level of rest twice as deep as sleep. So if you think about how profound would that rest be, twice as sleep as sleep, it's very Restful. Now the Beatles left midway in between that. Were you there after they left as well? No, I, I'd actually gone before they left. Oh really? Because yeah, I, w- I, I didn't block out enough time uh, to become a teacher of TM at that time. I did. I went back a couple of years later and became a TM teacher. Yeah. There's a funny uh, boot. There's a Beatle bootleg that's out. I actually have a copy of it. And there's a song on there they sang Happy for you. Happy birthday, Michael Love. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, Happy it's for, cute. Do you have it? Yeah, I have a copy of that. I was going to say, we could send you a copy. If you, I thought that was a, a, a nice tribute to oh, you. Oh, it was great. It was, well, do you remember it was when my they did birthday. That George Harrison and I are both Pisces. And and it was on my birthday. The, uh, Marishi had like fireworks and, and Indian musicians and, and magicians and, <laughs> and all kinds of neat things going on. And they celebrated his birthday and my birthday, you know, within a few days of each other. And uh, that the Beatles just did that as a gift. They, they got together. And That's real. You have your own personal Beatles song. That's right. I do. It's That's pretty neat. Music. <laughs> the other thing is, McCartney was sitting there. At the, I was sitting down at the breakfast table. McCartney came down with his acoustic and he was playing back in the USSR. And I told him, you know, hey, what you got to do is talk about the girls all around Russia, and Ukraine, and mm-hmm. Georgia, and all this kind of stuff. Lenny McCartney love composition. Exactly. Could have been. Should have been. Uh, yeah, but the prick never gave me any. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, okay. We can we can rewind that. No, I was, he, he, he was plenty creative enough not to need any uh, lyrical help from me, but I, I gave him the idea for that that little section. Was there a rivalry or competition in the '60s? Because you know the Beach Boys were America's band, the Beatles were, you know, it was the British Invasion. Was there a rivalry that maybe a friendly one that pushed yeah. you guys further? Oh, I, I think so. Yeah, uh, there was no one at the time more. Uh, that pro- more profoundly impacted the industry than the Beatles, and there was no one hotter uh, at that at that point in time for a couple of years there you know, than, than the Beatles. Uh, but the Beach Boys, um, well, I mean, we we were fortunate enough to be voted the number one group in England over the Beatles, who were two, and the Stones three, and the Musical Express, right at the height of Beatlemania. So it's like. Uh, that was I get around fared pretty well over there, and, and uh, you know. so so the problem from our side was it wasn't the Beatles, it was the record company and our weak management. They had they had a, a big push going on, and basically uh, we were just relying on momentum mm-hmm. of our our hits. We didn't you know. Uh, we weren't handled uh, with the kind of uh, promotional uh, chutzpah that, 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 let's say, uh, the Beatles uh, manager, uh, Brian, Brian Epstein, Epstein uh, that he, he seemed to have a bit of a flair for presentation. Or it's theatrical. Yeah. Yeah. We had accountants at that time. <laughs> was McCartney on the vegetable session? That's a question a lot of people. Yeah, he, he came. Well, there are a couple of different sessions, and he came to one definitely. Yeah. Was he chomping celery with you guys? I'm not sure what he was chomping. He might have been chomping hashish at the moment. I, 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 those some of those sessions were fairly uh, foggy. But you guys, I mean, smoggy. Back in the USSR was really an homage to to the Beach Boys, obviously, listening to the song and the, in yes. the lyrical style as well. Yeah, well, that was my being in India influence of Paul to write that song, and, and it was kind of neat. When you heard it back, what went through your mind? Well, I thought it was, I thought it was, it was, it was, I think it was fun of them to do that. It was lighthearted and humorous of, of them to, to, to do it. Uh, a take on the Beach Boys. And I'm know? proud I was here in Washington eight years ago to see you guys play it with Ringo. That's right, Ringo. And he played on California Calling, so you guys, uh, yeah, Ringo yeah. and Skins. Yeah. That was neat to see the Beach Boys, a song that they should have recorded. I think so, it. too. I think so. We should, do, we should it, 
So you asked me about George Harrison. Sure. We went to Royal Albert Hall, which was a beautiful, that, that is a classic yeah. facility. Uh, Alan, Bruce, and myself flew over, uh, and basically Maharishi people asked if we'd come over and do a, a show for the Natural Law Party, which we were ready, willing, and able to do, but it didn't work out because the the ask is too late, really. The, the lead times weren't enough to get permits and such. But we decided to go over anyway and, and go to the the event and the party. I'm glad we did. It was neat. And I thought, thought George Harrison sounded really good, did considering he? the fact that he hasn't been touring very much. He, I think he'd gone to Japan a few months, a couple months before that and played with Eric Clapton over there in Clapton's band. And he assembled, I think, Clapton's band once again. And, he sounded really good. I mean, wasn't that I what had the no point you were trying to get across? It? I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when the Beach Boys were inducted, which is such a thrill. You know, my favorite group, Beatles and, and Beach Boys, and mm -hmm. I'm there to mm -hmm. see it. And was that what you were trying to say with that? Because people were kind of like they didn't know it. Well, what I was trying to say, which uh, uh, um, who's the guy that was? That was so sad. Yeah. That uh, group that some <clears throat> of the guys need. Money? Couldn't they have just for once just said, forget it? Do you that, know what I'm that, saying? That was my point with respect to Paul McCartney by not being there. And Diana Ross, if she didn't want to stand up there with her, her one surviving uh, uh, Supreme, Supreme uh, why did The thing is, uh, what I, I, I said that Mick Jagger was chicken shit to get on stage with the Beach Boys. And it's true, and I meant every word of it. And people were cracking out. It was yeah, funny. I know. Uh, and the, the ultimately, what I was saying is that all this divisiveness and all these egos, it, with all the things that are going on in the world that need attention and need healing and need need uh, to be attended to, and all the power. In, in that industry, all they can come up with is a self-congratulatory, you know, Grammy-style event. That's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I call it the Rock and Roll Hall of Shame. Because yeah. you know, rock and roll was never meant to be a glamorous type of thing. Rock and roll is the music of the yeah. people, I guess. That's that's. And after I said said what I was able to say, I wasn't able to say what I ultimately I thought thought that all these diverse egos and all these people, it'd be neat if we could transcend management agencies, record company affiliations and everything else and unify and get behind some 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 much needed uh, uh, try to try to encourage solutions for some much needed problems like starvation, homelessness, yeah. AIDS, the environment, to name four. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I was also pissed when Paul Schaefer started playing Barbara Ann. Nothing against the song, but I was like, "Well, no, that was another, some original Beach Boys." That was song, another thing. Know? Maybe they didn't know him. <laughs> maybe the maybe the charts were too difficult for that. that I got. I was getting a little pissed off with that actually. I well, it's, it. well, I noticed that too. That's well, all they could come up with. Well, speaking of being angry, we're we're kind of angry about the Landy situation. We want to see. Could you rectify what's going on with that? What's happening with it? Is he gone from? Is he still with him, or what's the deal? No, he's been, uh, Brian surrendered to a conservatorship. Okay. Uh, the reason being, and Carl mainly was the reason why, uh, uh, it was the motivating factor there. My, my brother Stan started the conservatorship proceedings because yes. he felt that Landy was, was and had been for several years exercising undue influence on Brian and taking his money <laughs> in the process. So Carl got in there and, and, and engaged an attorney who was an uh, expert at this sort of thing and, and spent a lot of his own personal money to get Brian out of the hands of Landy and into a conservatorship. They had so much dirt on Landy that had it gone to court, uh, he would have been uh, he'd probably be in jail right now instead of whatever else he's doing. So no, Landy is prohibited to, to even have any contact with Brian. I'm not sure that that is being adhered to 100%, but he definitely doesn't have the day in and day out grip on him. That he, I heard he was co-writing songs with Bob Dylan. You know, Bob needed some lyrical help, so I heard he was, 
Landy? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, no, yeah. Because he's a major <laughs> lyrical talent. Well, Landy doesn't have the, the, uh, the, uh, what the talent to support his greed, or in his case, avarice. Unbridled avarice would be mm. a better way of putting it, probably. And, or, um, He's got this tremendous ego, but he doesn't have the talent to support it. To stand up, yeah. Yeah, so he was supposed to be in Brian's life for a year to a year and a half, Amazing. during which time he was going to get Brian through, through his 24-hour-a-day therapy, or therapy, he called it, this intensive therapy. He was supposed to get Brian in the shape where Brian would fire him because he no longer need him, and maybe go a week, uh, once or twice a week mm. to, for some counseling and stuff. But uh, Landy was an aspiring producer, writer, and so on. He loved the business so much that he, he, he wanted, he almost, he stepped into Brian's shoes, almost. Uh, he, it, Brian was incapable of thinking like Landy, but La Landy became Brian's surrogate, almost. He, 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 he well, he was a rock star. Yeah, he, he acted and behaved as a rock star. He, he, he and his, 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 uh, his wife uh, wrote lyrics for Brian, and they just weren't, they weren't talented enough to bring it off. Yeah. What did you think of the book, Brian's book? Wouldn't I never nice? read it. Yeah. However, ep excerpts have been read to me, which uh, have caused me to uh, prepare a lawsuit against Brian. They feel that a lot of it was landy. We'll find out yeah. in deposition. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. We're hoping. Absolutely. Because, see, Brian has had the benefit of getting money from Al, Carl, Mike, and Bruce's traveling for the last nine years while he's been supposedly getting in therapy with Landy. In the meantime, Brian did two solo albums and a book defaming the group, me personally, uh, other people, anybody, Brian's mom, <laughs> you know, all kinds of, that was hard. yeah, it was, it's terrible stuff. Now you got to understand that Brian has been diagnosed, as, among other things, paranoid schizophrenic. So he has delusions, but these delusions are printed in a book as if they're fact, mm -hmm. and they're, they're not, and I want him to 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 formally not only apologize, retract everything that that was not fact, mm -hmm. and set the record straight. That and and the other thing is that which is not known uh, to the extent. I mean, there's been a little issue of California girls, me writing the lyrics. I was going to ask so you what's, about that. But what is not known is that I wrote. Many, 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 I mean, we're talking a couple dozen songs that I wrote that I was not credited for. I was going to ask you um, why, because Brian in interviews has said a few times that he felt a, a little guilty that you weren't credited as a lyricist. California Girls is one of your best lyrics and you weren't even credited. Mm -hmm. Why weren't you credited? Could you please tell some of the other songs you're involved with? Because love, I'd love to listen back. It will be interesting. Wouldn't that be wild? Well, it's going to be. Uh, see, Brian Wilson just—they just signed a deal day before yesterday with Brian for another record, or no, the Sweet and no, Sound. No, for signed a settlement of his oh. claims against uh, the publisher. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Irving yeah, they have Irving. Yeah, Irving. Yeah, ten million dollars. So. But I felt bad about that because he kind of he gave away the rights to the songs afterwards. Do you think that was a good thing, or no? I don't know if I would. Give no, but see his. It's my assumption, it's only an assumption, that his um, legal advisors are interested in taking the money and running. God, that's so sad. Yeah. I mean, he's, going, he's basically jerking himself around in the long run. I mean... Well, Brian is, Brian is a pathetic figure. And one of the more pathetic things is that he stole, and he did not give me... Uh, Credit for for many many songs which I wrote, and I have a tell us some huge I list of them. I don't know where. It is unbelievable. Did you hear the Sweet and Sound like, record? By the way, you heard it. 
The Sweet Insanity, the second no. solo record? No, I didn't. I didn't listen to it. Did you? Yeah, we have it. Copy. What do you think? It's floating around. Uh, I certainly would have liked the Beach Boys to have been on it. It would have been an amazing guys, record. And, and basically with some of your lyrics, because Landy's lyrics are lyrics scary. Are <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have it for you. That's what they you said. Didn't, didn't the record... We have it for you. Is the record going to come out on a record company? No, it's floating in collector's oh, circles. Okay. And we're, su yeah. we're such fans that we yeah. we got a copy, so we brought one for you. Guys, I'd have your head examined. Well, we, I'm just kidding. we do like Brian as a writer when he comes up with good stuff. Hey, there's nobody more talented. At, at yeah. arranging and, and did you, you know. like his first solo record? What did you think of no. that? You didn't like it? Fuck no. What did you like about it? First of all, the lyrics. Second of all, uh, the arrangements weren't commercial enough. Third of all, he sounded like shit compared to what he can sound like. Yeah. I couldn't imagine what I could imagine what it would have sounded like with you and Carl and Al singing and Bruce. I mean, because. Some, I'll be curious what you think of Sweet Insanity. We're going to be at the show tomorrow. Maybe you can tell us what you think okay. tomorrow. Because I think some of the songs, the music is really good. Okay, so but lyrics. Uh, there's some okay. Sure. Tell us about Little some. Saint Nick. Oh, really? Little Saint Nick, right? Yeah. Brian Wilson is credited with writing 100% of that. Well, guess who wrote the words? Mike Love. Okay. That's who wrote the words. Don't Back Down. Oh, one it's, of my favorites. It's That's very cool. well known that Brian did not serve. Yeah. I wrote Catch a Wave and Don't Back Down. He's credited with 100%. He well, did not give me any credit. Happen? How could this happen? Because he didn't put my name down. Murray Wilson was the publisher and put, put, in, tunes, put in for this stuff. Interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Same thing with The Man with All the Toys, Santa's Beard. Merry Christmas, so baby. Good. <laughs> I love that song. Yeah, there's Good to My Baby, Brian Wilson, 100%. Guess who wrote the words? Wow. Dr. Love, that's who. Dr. Love. When I grew up, I participated in that. Didn't get a stitch of recognition. Oh Help God. me, Rhonda. I, I wrote, uh, since you put me down, I've been out doing in my head. Doing in my head is my fucking line. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> That's unbelievable. This is unbelievable. That's and things okay. like, well, we'll get this out. Dance, there. dance, so dance. No. I asked Carl, did you write any words for dance? And he says, no. He just the guitar line. Ding, 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 ding. Cool line. Yeah. But yeah, it is a cool line. Brian Wilson, Carl Wilson split 50 50 on that. I was the one who wrote, you know, this is Chuck Berry style of alliteration lyrics. That's my scene, mm -hmm. right? Now, was this more it's Landy a, doing this, changing no, this it? this is or way was before Landy. Really this is Brian and his father. Oh, no, not Landy. I meant Murray. Was Murray. it more Murray the one changing it? Was he the well, Either that or Brian didn't tell him because of Brian's ego or whatever. But it's, it's, it's a bloodbath. I'm telling you, he, uh, it's... Millions and millions of dollars worth of, of sure. damage. Oh, Ca well, California Girls, it, I think, is a real crime because that's that probably one of the most classic. That's just one song. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that yeah. alone. You know, I was curious when you would listen to when Brian would play something. Would he play for you a demo on a tape, or, or would he play the piano? Could you kind of instantly envision what a song would engender lyrically, or was yeah, yeah? For instance, Wild Honey and Darling. I wrote the word, all the words of those. He went, you know. Let's see. Let me see. Let me see if I can find Wild Honey and Darling. <laughs> I think I think you're credited on Darling. You're credited. And, yeah, I think I did. I get credit on that. And Wild Honey too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, That's I was. Amazing. It's 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 it's. That's sick sad. Stuff. That That's, yeah. hope something comes of it. That is sick. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> sick stuff. Another song is he arbitrarily assigned me a percentage, which is fairly nominal, basically. Right. Yeah, when when I wrote 100 percent of the words, they give me like 30 percent of the of the tune, as opposed to as opposed to as opposed to a split. Yeah. Oh. So anyway, any later songs? The glaring ones happened? were like. Uh, Where's some of the other glaring? Well, later, later was Brother Publish. Okay, so you're a cool one. Yeah. What are some of the other ones you want to mention? We can at least rectify the situation. For some <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can't monetarily rectify it, but we can rectify the knowledge that's out there, which is at least something. Hmm. 
So I guess the bad question to ask is, would you ever work again with Brian as a writer or producing? Sure, but, but I want him to, to uh, well, like, dance, dance, dance. Did I say dance, dance, dance? Yeah. yeah. I wrote the words to that. Be true to your school. Yeah. I wrote a lot of words to that. It wasn't credited. Now, have you like been I said, help me, Rhonda. You know? yeah, that's, that's crazy. I mean, virtually all the songs were chart records. I had a hand in writing some, if not all, of the lyrics. Mm. Yeah. Have you been in touch with Brian at all? And have you talked to him about this, or just it's not something you deal no, with? He's paranoid. He, he, we tried to have a board meeting where he was supposed to show up because he's a member of Brother Records board, and he, he didn't come. Mm. Regardless of the problems, though, I mean, as a team, and the songs that we do, we did know about that you guys collaborated. It was a great, it was a great team. So it would, it so would, it would have been be nice to, if I would have been credited with "Catch a Wave," you know, which wow. he's he says 100 percent, 100 percent, Brian Wilson, right? Right. B. Wilson, 100 percent. See, South Bay Surfer. B. Hawaii, Wilson, you D. co-wrote. Wilson. You wrote yeah, some of Hawaii. Uh -huh. Absolutely, I wrote the words to Hawaii and "Surfer's Rule," and "Catch a Wave." Well, all that stuff, when you think about it, sounds yeah. like Mike Love lyrics. You fucking ain't you're damn it right, and there's a reason why, too. Well, be true to your school. When some loud bragger tries to put you down and says, this school's great, I tell him right away, now, what's the matter, buddy? Ain't you heard of my school? Yeah. Win. <laughs> Win. So, I mean, I wrote, I wrote those words. You know? Little St. Nick just leaps out of it. You made me say it. It's like yeah. so oh. obvious. That's oh, yeah. yeah. Warmth of the sun. You, I'm going to ask you about that, actually, yeah. so I can... You co-wrote that. I think yeah. I know you're listed with that. Yeah, it was credited. The, you know, 50, so there will 50, be some 50, litigation. Right? Mentioning is to what about them? That you co-wrote them. Oh, absolutely. Well, you Denny's drums. I well, not Denny's know, drums. Right? I get around and uh, there's a sl there's a limit to my what I will take credit for. <laughs> no, I meant no, but I get around. He he put in for a hundred percent of that. Guess who came up? I came up. Doctor Love got witnesses. Al Jardine. We'll test it by in a court of law. So I came up with round, round, get around, I get around. If that's not a hook, I don't know what the that's fuck is. Right. You know? <laughs> like a snare of Marlin. Yeah, I know. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that was a chicken shit move to credit himself with 100% when I wrote that, the musical book of, of it, and uh, the words. Mm -hmm. You know? How about uh, All Summer Long? Yeah, I wrote. Uh, Remember when you spilled coke all over your blouse and mm -hmm. t-shirts cut off and a pair of thongs would be on the sun all summer? Wow. Yeah. So, so when will they wrote that with him. See, I, I put here, best in my recollection, what I wrote. I wrote 50% of words on that. Uh, Brian had, I get around from town to town. I'm a real cool head making real good bread. I wrote the, the verses, though, and the round, round, get around. Now, now, what are you what are you doing with this? Will this be going to court? Suing his ass to pieces because he's hiding behind his lawyers and, and all that kind of stuff. Have you already started this? Oh yes. The suit? Wow. Well, I mean, it's being prepared. It'll be it'll it'll probably hit pretty soon. Wow. You know, I mean, um, next week or so you'll hear about it. Speaking Crime, of crimes, what is it? A trial watch. Speaking of, of <laughs> back to Diane Sawyer. Oh boy. Speaking of a book. Um, mm -hmm. It's the 30, you know, 30th anniversary of the Beach Boys. With all these schlocky books that come out, like the Heroes and Villains, these these mm -hmm. dirt-oriented books, and you know, the Wouldn't It Be Nice? Yellow which, journalism. Yeah, things like that. Yeah. Haven't you cons have you guys considered actually putting out a book in the words of the Beach Boys for the 30th anniversary or something? Because that, in a way, could rectify a lot of misinformation and inaccuracies in yellow journalism. Have you thought about that? Because we would love it. I, I know think a lot my of fans ego would. is that strong in that kind of department. I mean, I have a strong ego in terms of competition and creativity, and I'm, I'm proud of what contributions I've made. And hang on to your ego, okay? That used to be hang on to your ego, and then it became uh, I know there's an answer. Oh yeah, no, I just I changed the lyrics yeah. from hang on to your ego because I thought it was too acid. Yeah, it was too acid for me anyway. That was, you know, that was those guys doing acid, Van Dyke Parks and Brian, Tony so, Asher. So no, no, no chances for a book at this moment. Uh, who would want to fucking take the time to go through garbage like that? I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just just to rectify garbage. I mean, what I want is Brian to, to admit and say that 
half the stuff he said in his book was outrageous bullshit, and it's because of his yeah. paranoid delusions that he came up with this stuff, that it's not factual, number one. Number two is, yes, Mike Love wrote this, 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 and this. And if he actually does not forget, and I got witnesses to say, or we can have a lie detector test brought to bear, then let's go. I just want to have it be fair. I mean, that's the one thing I like to have is a little bit of fairness because he's been very unfair to the rest of the group over the years. Now, Brian is a, is very, what do you call it, ingenuous? I mean, you want to like him. You want to feel sorry for him mm -hmm. because he's destroyed his life. I mean, who wouldn't feel sorry for a guy who is very gifted and destroyed his life? But what the untold story is, he's selfish, has is defrauded his cousin, he has cheated his group, he has he's been taken money and has not performed up to for the, the intent of his getting money to have therapy was not for him to do two solo albums and write a book defaming individuals and the group. I don't want to be in the room so, when you listen to the song Brian from that album. Yeah, well, what well he mentions is how his mother, what, what are some the, 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 the lyrics? Are yeah, but yes. you'll have to hear it. Well, but see, it's it's the guy has mental problems. Yeah. But I mean, at this, you, in the song, he met, he comes right at you at one point. He says, but he comes at he comes at Carl too. Yeah, in the mind, it's unbelievable. In the mind, but do you he's, think he he's still nuts, has? But the thing he, is, he's crazy. Does That's he still the have he's, the? Or he's a genius, but he's yeah. nuts. Yeah. So That's a lot it. of things he imagines, like the two by four. That the, the his father was supposed mm -hmm. to be beating him with. That's is his delusion. Is Mary made out to be worse than he was? Murray was a prick. In was he? Was he? He still he was. was awful. I would. I mean, I'm so glad he wasn't my father. I mean, he definitely did some damage to. Uh, mainly, I mean, Carl's uh, gotten a grip on on on, on life, but uh, you know, Dennis sure didn't. Uh, he kind of lost his grip. <laughs> so he really was kind of a tyrant. Oh, def, very abusive and, and gruff and, and and terrifying. You know, and intimidating mm -hmm. and. Uh, Negative. I mean, you don't. You guys don't know what you're doing. You know, that kind of thing. Those kind of remarks. Very unsupportive. However, he was he an aspiring songwriter, and he n knew that there was a value to songs. There was a publishing value on the writer's side. I didn't even know what publishing was when we started. Out. Didn't I wasn't from a show business background. My sure. dad was a sheet metal worker. My mom's a housewife. All I knew was I liked to sing, and, and I could make up words. I, yeah. was, uh, I liked poetry. Did you have that talent yeah. at an early age oh, in yeah. school? Oh, yeah. sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wrote my first song when I was maybe 10 years old, something like that. What was it called, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Was it about the beach? No. And, well, I had a name for it, and then Murray changed it. So Murray had some good qualities. Some. A few? Yeah, he was, no, he was very good at, at, at promoting mm -hmm. the group, and getting radio stations to play records, and he was very smart and clever about it. He would have us go out and do hops and, and, and that, yeah. uh, events where a DJ would make a couple hundred bucks, we'd make a couple hundred bucks, mm -hmm. and the DJ, since he made some money, he'd be playing our records the next six months until we came back and did it again. So we built a real good foundation doing that kind of thing, all, not only in Southern California, but all around the country, the one until thing, we got a momentum going. The, the one it. thing I have to like about Mary, and I, unless this is not true, he did co-write one of my favorite Beach Boys songs, Breakaway. I don't know if that's, co if maybe he didn't with what's coming out in light now, but I, I really like Breakaway, so if he had something to do with that, that's, to me, his one good trait from what I've heard. Hmm. Could, I, don't, I don't, wouldn't know. To, see, there's interesting things like 409. Um, I came up with She's Real Fine, my 409, Giddy Up, Giddy Up, 409. It was not credited. But Brian Wilson did give credit to uh, Gary Usher Gary. for his contributions. So it was it was weird. It was it was almost it was like directly against me. He wouldn't fuck with somebody else, but he screwed me over royally. That's what I was going to ask you. 
Were you disappointed when Brian would go off and write with like a, a Tony Asher or a Van Dyke Parks or a Gary Usher or, or um, a Roger Christian? What were your feelings on well, that? Why would he go off? I was, I was um, not happy about it. Yeah. But um, in the case of uh, Roger Christian, I wasn't as into the terminology of car songs as he was. Although I wrote I Get Around, which is, I guess, a cruising song, but it's more generic. It's not super stock Dodge, you know, kind of, or the four in the not floor. You know, it wasn't like... Uh, not every word was a catchphrase. Yeah, competition clutch was four in the floor. I, did, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't into hot rods to the extent that, that Roger Christian was. So he provided some content, mm -hmm. lyrical content there, right. to support Brian's musical abilities. So that was good. Uh, but when I did come up with a hook or, or a, 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 some lyrics, like uh, it was funny. It was almost like it was not recognized. It was not. It was, yeah, it was not. Definitely not a uh, legally or uh, recognized. So you you were you must have been disappointed about the, the Tony Asher with Pet Sounds. Well, right? now that's a different story. Now uh, when it got to that but that period of Brian's life, that was when he was doing a lot of drugs. So, and we were touring a lot, and we'd come back in and do an album like Pet Sounds, for instance. And if some of the words were so totally offensive to me that I wouldn't even sing them because I thought it was too nauseating. I mean, that was my. That was that was hang my, on to your ego? Would that yeah, fit the bill? Yeah. To me, that was too too much of a doper song for me. I mean, I just I didn't want to have anything to do with that. So therefore, I didn't go down that road of acid and the things that destroyed Brian's brain, okay? I didn't want to go that route, so I, I just kind of, I'd still come up with sessions, and I still wrote the words of good vibrations, but I didn't participate in a lot of the stuff that was going on there, because I just didn't think that the psychedelic Root was the way to go. You know, his work changed so much with that album. You could hear it, you could hear it in today, the fruits of what was going to happen in terms of his writing progressing. But mm -hmm. I remember I read a quote a while back when Carl said when he first heard the record, he first heard, not the record, but Brian playing some songs over the phone, and he said it, it sounded so bizarre. What was your reaction initially to the material? Did you well, think that sounds was fine? He was still intact, but from there it was, I mean, Good Vibrations was great. That, that and Heroes and Villains was sort of his high point, and then from there, from the toilet, because mentally he was incapacitated, emotionally he was destroyed by the acid, is my opinion. Good Vibrations, there's a lot of different versions with some different lyrics and things like that mm -hmm. as well. Did you write out of quite a few sets of lyrics, nope. and how just quickly did it take? I just wrote one set on the way to the session. Yeah. Where was the session done? It was in, it was in Hollywood. Yeah, it was no, it was at the uh, Columbia Studios. Wow. And yeah, I wrote it, um, dictated it to my then wife Suzanne, uh, on the way on the Hollywood freeway, on the way from Burbank to the studio. So it was about a fifteen minute drive. Right? Just, mm -hmm. just dictated the words. This is a strange rumor that's been going around in some books. Please set it straight. At the San Diego Zoo, when you shot the cover for Pet Sounds, there was a story that. Dennis and some of the other guys got thrown out of the zoo because they were kind of tormenting the animals. Any truth to that? I don't remember. I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't a part of tormenting the animals. I don't. No, remember. no, I didn't think so. I don't remember that. Yeah. Did I you guys have any input in a cover like that, or was that another one of the covers that was picked? Because that's a great cover. That mind. was. That was simply us going on location to shoot a photo. You know, pet sounds. We thought petting zoo. No, mm -hmm. that is your title, correct? Yeah, we suggested that. Yeah. Yeah. And you did get the credit for that. At least people know that. Right. It's a classic album. Gee, I got credit for something. <laughs> I want <laughs> money, but I got credit. Well, no, um, I wanted to. No, ask I just, I, you know, in, see, I didn't really know how badly I had been abused until I saw I was deposed by, in, 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 in Brian's pursuit of his claims against Irving Almo. Mitchell Silverberg and Nup, which is the attorney representing both the Beach Boys and Irving Alamo, inherent conflict of interest there. At any rate, I didn't know to what degree I'd been uh, 
taken advantage of until I actually got in the deposition. I saw that and I said, oh my goodness. And I wasn't even really advised to my rights until just recently, in the last few months, I've, I've uh, uh, consulted with a, an attorney who's a very good uh, litigation type of attorney and done some incredible research on the rights of a songwriter that I never even heard of from anybody until he started rising me of these things. And this is this is why on the basis of these rights and and the potential remedy that I have, I have a, a very, very good case against Brian Wilson. And I hope that you know, I hope that we don't have to go to trial because it's gonna destroy Brian and he's gonna be destroyed in depositions, first of all, let alone getting to court. To what it'll do to him Mentally, is he even capable of standing trial? But there, there is that, there is that defense. They'll probably try to show up, but then he'll, we'll just get. If he was capable enough to go through all the stuff that, yeah, then apparently he's capable of remembering. You know, off on, off on, actually a fun topic. Spinal Tap have put out another record. They just finished a tour. I actually saw them the other night. They're really fun. Have you seen the movie? What was your reaction? to it if you hadn't had you guys experienced any spinal tap have you ever seen the movie this sure. is spinal tap what did you think of About it four or five times oh you mean the new newer no the movie the, the movie old that one? was out the classic didn't they do an album or something they just put out a record yeah which is a big disastrous bomb i heard <laughs> what did you think of the movie did it hold true were you what did, what were your thoughts on the movie on the movie spinal tap you really want to know why well Basically, what I'm doing. What did you think of the movie? We'd love to include you in the in the TV show as well. Jesus, <laughs> what did I think of Spinal Tap the movie? Was it, we could say it's been a source of a lot of late night bus ride chuckles. That's about all I I, I would really say about it. because I don't want to be critical of, of of a spoof. I mean that's dumb. I mean that'd be like you know being critical of Barb Brand or something. Did you laugh a lot? Yeah, it's funny. Any, any it's absurdly funny, and, 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 and for because you were musicians and had our moments on the road, we, we can identify with someone as a crack up. You ever lose so, your way to the stage? Yeah, there's been there's been facilities where it's a, a, a what do you call it a, a maze. That's it's hilarious. A, it was a fun. There's some funny bits in that thing. You wrote one of your best songs with Brian, uh, The Warmth of the Sun, the day mm -hmm. of the JFK assassination, which... It was the early morning hours just before that. Oh, yeah. early morning? Before. Yeah, it was like 1, 2 in the morning we wrote that. And then we went to sleep about 2, 3 in the morning. And uh, Brian had moved out of his house, his parental home in Hawthorne, to a rented house, and I, I was spending the night there. And uh, we had written this song. I, I wrote the words. He, did most of the music. Wow. I'm going to go into some, some thumbnail sketches for CD review asking about, mm -hmm. you know, a few songs, albums, just real brief things, whatever comes to mind. How did you come to write the lyrics for California Girls? How did I come to write the lyrics? Yeah, I mean, was there a, per, was there a certain girl that you were thinking of? No, no, no. I was just mind? thinking, well, I was thinking, by that time we had traveled a bit. Uh, we had had some hit records. We'd gone all over. We'd been to Hawaii, we'd been to Australia, we'd been all around the United States, and I just uh, thought it was the neat thing about the United States was that all these girls from all over the world were living here, and that was the premise of the song. Mm -hmm. Some people confuse it with thinking that we're being uh, extolling the virtues of simply California girls, but if you listen to the lyrics, it's about girls from all over the place and. I couldn't wait to get back to the States, back to the cutest girls in the world. So I just wrote it from that standpoint of having travels, seeing a bit of the world, but really digging the fact that no matter where you go in the world, they're all they're all in the United States. <laughs> That's true. They're the best girls. That's great. And we wish that they could all be California girls. That's the key line. So, yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, it's just, just, you know, it's just kind of taking what we'd seen around and, and kind of wishing they'd all be back there in California with us. From the Beach Boys today, you co-write one of the most beautiful songs, which I, I saw you guys do last year, Please Let Me Wonder. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything about uh, the, the writing of that or even the recording of that? Record? I remember wondering about the title, not relating to the title so great, but writing the lyrics. 
about writing the verses, yeah. Were you someone that, that could pretty much come up with a lyric pretty quick? Was there a lot of retooling yeah. that you needed, or you pretty much could crystallize an idea? <clears throat> yeah, well, like Wild Honey, Brian was doing this track with a theremin. He's a theremin again after Good Vibrations. He's a theremin of Wild Honey. He's doing the track. I went out to the kitchen. We were in this health food thing. And wild Honey was all natural, you know, mm -hmm. from the flowers. So. so there's this can of Wild Honey. We were making some tea while he was going back in the studio. I said, well, I'll write the lyrics about this girl who's a wild little honey. You know? And I wrote it from this perspective that actually who should be singing it. Because the, that album was Brian's R&B-influenced album in his mind. It may not have sounded like it to a Motown executive, but that was where he's come from on that. And in that particular instance, I wrote it from the perspective of Stevie Wonder singing it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny on that record, you also covered a Stevie Wonder song. I was, just, I was, I was made to love. Made to love it, which is great. Yeah. Which is great as well. Yeah. How about Smiley, Carl. Smiley, Smile? Carl has compared it. Instead of Smile coming out, he said it was a bunt instead of a grand slam. That's true. What are your thoughts on the record? Would it too much acid? Took Brian. Brian got so whacked out by that time. He's so sensitive. He's fragile uh, from from whatever he was doing and his uh, ingesting those non-prescribed uh, medicaments, medicine, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, he completely changed from being dynamic and, and competitive to like non-combative, non non-dynamic. Non the opposite, and so Smile was in the direction of the same direction as Good Vibrations and Heroes and Villains, and then all of a sudden, it's grinding, screeching, halt, 180 degree turn, and it became Smiley Smile for whatever reason. Will it ever come out? We, we, we keep getting these reports, it's, it's being ready, it's being ready. Would you like to see it come out, or is it something? Well, there are brilliant pieces of music but it's disjointed and fragmented and unfinished. So I don't I don't think I don't see any real venue for it. I don't see any real reason for it to come out other other than certain collectors would like to hear some of those unfinished tapes and they probably have them anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't say anything. Yeah. Won't say anything. You lousy bastards, that'll be twenty dollars each. Brian has mentioned one of his favorite songs he co wrote with you was Do It Again, mm -hmm. which is a great song. Tell me a bit about that one. Was that were you thinking to return to, you know, how great it would be to return to you know, I went time. surfing with my old high school buddy, surfing. Bill Johnson. Yeah, and I went down to Bill Jackson. Excuse me, Bill Jackson. I was getting confused with Bruce Johnston. Anyway, Who? Bill Jackson and I went down, to, went surfing uh, down in San Onofre and in, in, in a place called Trestles, which is on the Camp Pendleton Marine Marine Base down mm -hmm. down in Southern California. You know, I came back, it was a beautiful day, and the waves were perfect, and it was gorgeous. And I just wrote that as a, as a sort of a diary of the day's events, and, and it took about no more than ten minutes to write it. Could, can you tell when a song really has a magic to it, even when you're finishing up the lyrics? Can, can you tell when a song is going to be a winner as, as opposed to something that, eh, it's a stinker? Do songs grow? with meanings over time for you? I have an instinct for what's commercial and when, it, when I don't listen to it, when I don't adhere to it, when I don't sometimes fight for it, then it often is not successful. What was the deal with the, the, the Never Learn Not to Love, the Manson song? Did you know it was a Manson song? Did you even have any dealings? I guess Dennis was friendly with him. What was I, that situation? I knew of Dennis' relationship. Uh, I didn't know specifics on who wrote what on which song. So Did you like there. the song? Not particularly. No, no. What do you think of Sunflower? A lot of people cite that as the best collective album. Brian's influence really didn't pervade the album as much as it was a real collective Beach Boy album. I liked it. I like it. Does that add some music to your days, yeah. Anna? I like that song a lot. I thought that was a neat song. And uh, what else is on there? I forget. This whole world. This, oh, um, this, it's right. Yeah, that was a great. Song. I thought that was a great song by Brian, uh, mainly. You know. Yeah, 
it's a, it, it's a philosophical kind of thing. It's a very, very nice song. See, now Brian at that point in time was capable of a song or two, but he wasn't capable of coherent thought for ten songs. That's when you that took was, over. Well, then, when I you took over the reins. Yeah, then it the became more of a. Dim, well, Carl took over the reins. Bruce took over the reins. Um, outside producer took over the reins. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I always took a sort of a laissez-faire attitude towards it. I mean, I almost said, you know, I, I sort of did not participate. First of all, I do not like recording. You don't? No. It's boring. Why do you like? Yeah, I like writing songs, singing them, but I don't like the tedium involved, the tedious process the, hmm. the uh, of recording. That's interesting. I don't like it. I'd rather be outdoors. I'd rather be in nature. I'd rather be uh, reading a good book, going to a movie, uh, uh, you know, doing something with uh, the girl on the cover of the new album. Yeah, exactly. Who I happen to, to live with, and it happens to be the mother of our little four-year-old boy coming up pretty soon. So what? I'm jealous. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> so anyway, she uh, have a sister. Yeah, she does, and she's in the hotel too. Cool. A little young, though. Uh, 13, I think. So. Well, yeah. if she doesn't talk, I won't talk. You're a, you're a mentor type. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, no, I don't, I have never wanted, it's like not my favorite thing to do is to go in a room somewhere in Hollywood and live there for six months mm -hmm. while you're making an album. It's just not my cup of tea. I, I, my disposition is not... That way, I'm not technically oriented. I don't okay. care what kind of technology you're using to record. I care what it sounds like. I care what the lyrics say. I care that it's commercial, so you're not wasting your time and just doing a subjective, egotistical exercise. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so, so, um, I don't disdain it. I just don't like it as much as other aspects of, of the business. So, therefore, I didn't like. I was never raring to get in there and be the producer on an album. I couldn't, you know, forget it. I'd rather write, let somebody else produce it, and be done with it. It's interesting. It if it makes it. Surf's Up exemplifies what you were talking about, how Brian would come up with a couple things, like he came up with Surf's Up for the record. Mm -hmm. Day in the Life really of the Tree, I know, which is one of your favorites. <laughs> well, no, that yeah, was Jack Riley. Jack Riley. I mean, his voice in there is not exactly. It's kind of like Landy's writing, you know. Yeah. Kind of like Landy's voice, actually. Yeah, the two. <laughs> well, you are a cool guy. Anyway. What yeah, did so you think of the Surf's Up record? There's some environmental themes pervading it. Um, Don't go near the water is a great song. Don't go near the water is a good song. I mean, it, it was a. It was an attempt on us to be sentient beings, you know. It was, it was actually Al and I were mostly into doing that song. You know, yeah. you know um, Al, in an interview we were listening to, had mentioned one of his highlights in terms of performing was playing Carnegie Hall in 71. Mm -hmm. did, did Carnegie Hall have that much of an impact for you, or was it another concert? Was it, I know, no, I think that was a really good, neat thing to do. I, what do you I, remember I, I about remember, Carnegie Hall? Well, I remember the... Uh, the uh, the feeling of that performance. Why did you go to that? No, no. I wish. We, we have, have, we have tapes. I got a couple photos from there. Yeah. We have tapes. Tape so. yeah. I remember meditating before going on there and feeling the 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 consciousness of the people in the auditorium, like buoying us. You opened it was good vibrations. Did you want to go back there? Wouldn't mind. Yeah. You know, there's been talk, um, rumors uh, as well, that you guys were planning at one good point. Good idea to do that. Though. It would be good. At one point, you guys were planning on doing For maybe. A benefit. Hmm, that's a good idea. An or 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 a, a version do the whole Peck Sounds album with an orchestra. Any thoughts on that? Bruce's. That's been one of Bruce's um, um, biggest desires, I would say, to do that. It would be good. Think it could happen. Yeah, it's possible that and other things. I think I think a symphonic album by the Beach Boys would be really a good thing to do. Several of the songs would blend themselves. I mean, the, the, the Moody Blues did it, right? Yeah, the opening of California Girls is an overture kind of thing. It's a very dramatic thing. Slip John B. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice? A lot of the songs. Would be, 
you know, great. Um, a lot of people talk about Lost Beach Boy gems that maybe just never really took took off commercially. But are there any are there any favorites of yours that you don't play live, but that you think are really good songs that most people aren't aware of? Because my God, the Beach Boys catalog is filled with great songs that you don't hear in concert and you don't hear on the radio. What are some of your personal favorites beyond songs you do that maybe kind of are lost classics? I know lost classics is just. Some some songs are great songs that you like a lot, and we as musicians would like a lot, but uh, are a, a bit esoteric for like what? public. Like what for you? Well, I'd be curious what you would pick. I Can Hear Music is good. And that's actually fairly popular if we do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, Sail on Sailor is good. I like It's About Time. Yeah, but that's too, uh, for, I mean, for me, it's a little bit too guitar-y, rowdy. So it's almost trying, us trying to be something that we aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, that ranks with student demonstration time in that department. Not that, I mean, it's almost like us trying to be an AOR band when we really are an AC band. I had probably the hardest stage um, yeah. guitar in any Beach Boy record. Yeah, exactly. Bluebirds Over the Mountain Bluebirds had some. Bluebirds Over the Mountain, that, that too. How did you guys come to select that? Because that was kind of an obscure song, at least for some people. Just like the melody. Yeah. yeah. Did you pick that? Uh, yeah, I thought the, 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 the lick, you know, the, 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 the guitar stuff was pretty neat too. Absolutely. What do you remember about the Holland record? Is that when you look back finally with? Thinking about uh, the experience of being at home was really neat. I thought it was cool to go outside the country and do something completely unusual, uh, geographically interesting and different. Everything over. Yeah. Unfortunately, we did. You know, <laughs> cost us an arm and a leg. But it, it, yeah, and the, the uh, California Saga. I that was kind of neat. That trilogy kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that, was, that was pretty cool. What do you think of the MIU album? That's kind of a that's kind of a lost classic album. I've been listening to that more and more recently. I love it. Well, there's some like like a lot of those albums that we did. There's some neat, like you said, gems on there. They're nice gems, but there wasn't there wasn't a coherence to to some of these. It was it was too democratic. Is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. And kind of like what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, it was everybody almost like coming into it with their song, which, song? which is okay, but it, like, okay, like if you have an album, <coughs> any CD or album it will, will do, if you have a hit song on it and it's very commercially viable, right. does it not make sense to have another song that would also be commercially viable in a third, in a fourth. Now, I'm talking about from, from a, not from a person who just likes the esoteria and, and, and the, the art of it all. I'm talking about to gain some sort of commercial recognition and, and which gives you more power over your lives and to do things that you would want to be able to say and do. In other words, if you're not a success commercially, then all you are, as in, in the Beach Boys case, would be a lovable anachronism. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you can be commercially viable, then you can be, you can have the, the money and the listening listenership, tune-in value, and the attention of the industry to where people will take you seriously, and you can. That one. Doing records, you want to have well, something that fits and offsets. Like, for instance, Michael Jackson does an album. He's not a group. He's an individual, and you know that the songs may vary in content and style, but there, the fact that he had several hit songs reach like number one, top five, number one, whatever, gives him the multi-platinum platform from which he, he, he lives his life and is able to do fantastic videos, start his own foundation called Heal the World Foundation, give money to 
whatever cause he believes in, endow a burn center here or give uh, money to the United Negro College Fund. So it gives him creative and economic freedom or ability to do certain things. That does not come about when you do an album that is fragmented, meaning okay, you may have a great idea, Al, or a great idea, Carl, or a great idea, Bruce, and a great idea, Brian, and Mike, and, but they may not be compatible in a marketing sense. They may not even be commercial. They might be an accommodation. And there's a difference between doing an album that is not merely a democratic accommodation of egos, but is using the collective best strengths of, of the group from the standpoint of what are they capable of performing? Who is the strongest writer? Who is the strongest arranger? Who are the, strong, who are the strongest vocalists in which ranges and what kinds of tempos and all that? So it's a cool, there's a whole lot of input that goes into to coming up with something that has the potential to be a lasting hit product. And that's what I set out to do with Summer in Paradise. Wow, wow. Well, because I know Carl Wilson's strength. And I know Al Jardine's strengths. Mm. And I know their weaknesses, too. Yeah. I know if left to their own pursuits, what they would do on their own, and where the weaknesses would be, lyrically, right. or 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 uh, singing wise I know that say for instance Al has a voice that he has not yet used on record what a great voice so he has a great voice for what he's known he has a great voice he has an even better voice commercially I believe in this one voice that's very you see I have different voices as you, as you know I have the Surf and Safari and Surf and USA voice I also have the Kokomo voice right you have the All I Want to Do voice from Sunflower kind of the real real well, that's closer voice. to Kokomo yeah that's true so, you know, that, and, and I have my bass singing voice, which is the bass of Surfer Girl in my room, Don't Worry Baby, that kind of stuff, which I love doing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the things I enjoy the most. That's great, too. The, the Kokomo voice happens to be, along with Carl's voice, which is pitched in the range of God only knows and, and good vibrations. Carl singing in a good vibrations range, as he says, and me singing in the Kokomo range, is very commercial. You know, it's a good counterpoint. There's me, and then there's him, and there's, and there's the backgrounds. So, so knowing that, Terry Melcher and I, Terry is like a scientist when it comes to this stuff. And Bruce is, he has the greatest sense of chords. He's amazing. He's close to Brian in that regard. Brian's a little bit more spontaneously, just regurgitates these kinds of chords and arrangements, just spontaneously. Bruce is equally, I think equally he's gifted, only not quite as spontaneous. He's more methodical about it. He more he thinks it out more than and, uh, and just feels it, you know. And, but, uh, which is not to be disparaging, it's just a different style of creativity. But but if you take the talents of Bruce on the, if you listen on the new album called The One Summer Night Cut, I don't know what we're going to call it, it might come up Lost Summer Nights or S slow summer nights, or slow dance, or <laughs> I don't know. We got a we got a title. This is because it is a composite of an earlier song and a new song. But anyway, if you hear the chord progressions on it, they're great. And, and so he's very sophisticated. Where Terry Melcher is not sophisticated in chord progressions, but he's great at drums and guitars, and he knows chords, but he can't. His fingers don't easily go to the progressions. Of Bruce. So you have Bruce's chord progression. Whereas Bruce is light in the drums, bass, guitar department, Terry is a monster in that, from the birds and, and, and the Paul Revere and the Raiders background, right? So you take those strengths, and then I'm lyrically, I think, where Terry will have a, a, a good idea lyrically, <clears throat> but he might, it might, to me, sound a little moon in June when he gets through with it. I will, I will ruminate over these lyrics for a long time to make sure that the, the they're both commercially acceptable, but also that 10 years from now, you'll live with them, mm -hmm. right? And that they fit cosmically some, somehow in some ethereal 
perspective that may be ethereal to me, but I know in fact that 20 years or 100 years from now there'll be reality in, in society. You know. So in other words, I don't want to do something that's just to get delivered on that album for that time, and because Moonrise with June were Multi done. Multi-layered meanings. Thing. Yeah. So exactly. So like, on the record, like on, on Kokomo, we'll put out to sea and we'll perfect our chemistry. By and by, we'll defy a little bit of gravity. Now, what nobody knows is when I wrote that, I'm thinking of there are endorphins that flow in the body when you're in love. Chemistry, you know, like there's a there's a thing that happens. Your heart, yeah. there's a thrill of emotion that goes through. It's actually physical chemistry, and that's why it's. We'll, we'll perfect our chemistry. By and by, we'll defy a little bit of gravity. I was even thinking, in that sense, why did I say defy gravity? Because in 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 the practice of the TM City program, there's sutras that you develop the the ability to to, to levitate. Have you ever levitated? Yeah, I practiced. I practiced doing this as part of my TM City program. And it's, it's worked. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you were fledgling hoppers, right? <laughs> but the idea is, with perfection of the mind and the body, you can actually learn to defy gravity. And so it showed up in the song, without proselytizing, without saying anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody I've ever even told in an interview has that perspective on that particular piece of that song. But a but hundred years from now, people will be, will be defying gravity just just uh, as a normal course of, of, see, there's a thing called survival of the fittest, right. where evolution marches forward, and people who are ignorant, violating the laws of nature, their societies pass out of existence. Mm -hmm. People who are more in tune and in harmony with nature, and using their full development of a conscious mind, are going to be those that survive. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that, I want people that survive a hundred years from now to, to realize that we are relevant, now, it's just like we did said in 72, don't go near the water. In 92, you have the Earth Summit with a hundred and something leaders, the biggest convention ever given. See, so there's a relevance to our music in from 1972 in 1992, and there's going to be relevance beyond that, too. So that, that's my mental process is to go to work on doing a song. Now, I don't always calculate like that. Yeah. Sometimes I'll say it's moon in June, it's boy and girl, and be done with it. Because that's a simple song. Do you believe that you were destined to do what you're doing? Do you believe that people are ch kind of chosen <coughs> um, to do what they're doing in life? I believe that the Beach Boys create what is called in Sanskrit sattva, which is positivity. Sure. Yeah, it, it, it's tangible. When you go out, you feel when, it. When you, go, when you walk out on the stage on July 4th in front of the monument and you get a standing ovation before you do anything, that's pretty good. <laughs> Not many people, even at the end of their concerts, get the kind of ovation we get at the beginning before we even do it. It is unbelievable. People Third, three generations of fans. Right. People anticipate that they're going to have a good time. We, we hit some chords, we make some sounds, we do some music, and it creates euphoria and positivity. With most people, unless they're on a... A, a total bummer, unless sure. they're a paid writer or something that they, to criticize uh, something that somebody's flat or sharp or didn't dress yeah. right or something, yeah. or didn't say the cool buzzword of that. that That's true. Of. The vibe at the shows, you know, even yeah. if you go in a bad mood, you leave in a good mood. Too. Well, hopefully. Yeah. But anyway, that so the Beach Boys create sattva, which is positivity, and it's spell that because I was a T T W A or T T W A. That's interesting. Yeah. I've never heard yeah. Well, you see, you got to hang out around Maharishi International University once there in a while. There you go. There you go. The anyway, one there's the whole Vedic technologies of, of consciousness to elevate consciousness, elevate mankind from all the despair and misery and ignorance and disease and frustration and wars and everything. And that is going to be a reality. The, the, the reality of life 20 years from now is going to be far more positive than it is today, and a hundred years from now, it's going to be infinitely more positive than it is today. It's a natural selective process, survival of the fittest. And, and you know, there's the technology exists today to communicate things like transcendental meditation or the TM City program to communicate that 
and there's scientific research being done that if you have a large body of people practicing these coherence creating methodologies that it influences the atmosphere even though you don't know what's going on it's influencing your the cells in your body because there are neurotransmitters and neuroreceivers in your cells if you're negative and hostile it exudes in the environment if you're positive and loving that exudes in the environment you can see it if you go into a room in a family where there's love and positivity it feels warm and happy and positive if you go into another room where there's negativity and frustration hostility, yeah. hostility it's tangible you can almost cut the tension with the knife right so it's it's going on there's billions of people out there who are lacking in fundamental basics like whether it be food or shelter or or they're diseased or they're violating laws of nature unbeknownst to them or known to them and and yet there's there there is a, a, a group of individuals also who are living more sattvic or positive lives which which that that those people will be supported by nature because they're in harmony with nature and there are technologies to to get a person more in tune with nature and develop more of that inner self and that's the value of TM for instance because we're all just little individualized nodules expressions of nature we're not separate from nature we act like it sometimes we cut nature down and we defile it and, 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 and abuse it and abuse it but there are laws that you excite when you do that. It's called as you sow, so she reap. Live by the sword, die by the sword. So the ozone layer going away and the, the air getting worse and the, and the pollution and this and the disease and all that is direct results of violations of laws of nature. So how do you get back get more into harmony with laws of nature? There are ways to do that. And that's that. Knowing that, uh, it's part of it's incumbent on me to without proselytizing say it it's some a little bit in the music and then if somebody's interested fine here's how you can really take care of business if you want for yourself for your family for your society and that's that's the message without being having a message to a summer in paradise for people after after they hear the interview or read the interview mm -hmm. want to get further involved with tm they just look up there's a, there's there's a, there's there's in the phone books in most major cities there's a transcendental meditation program there's a book by dr deepak chopra called perfect health and dr deepak chopra is a, a leading author who is, uh, has several best-selling books involving mind body medicine and he goes into some of the mechanics of how, how this these evolutionary uh, technologies help support progress and growth in an individual's life and for instance, if you learn TM, if you're over 40 and you practice TM regularly, there's you have 90% less health care utilization when it comes to heart disease. Is that true? Yeah. So, I mean, there's things like that which are very phenomenal because the effect of the mind, the quality of the mind and the body, well, the quality of thought and, and, and the quality of our mind influences our physical well-being so dramatically that mm -hmm. <clears throat> that a little bit of investment of a few minutes in the morning and the evening to meditate can, can, can clear the stress out, which stress weakens the organism and leads to disease, deterioration disease, and ultimately death. Yeah. You can reverse the disease, reverse the aging process, reverse all kinds of, and avoid all kinds of negative mm -hmm. things by strengthening the nervous system by regular practice of TM, which is yeah, This is good. I'm going to get that out there. You know, one more song I do have to ask you about, and it is kind of esoteric well, album. I wanted to mention one other thing okay, on, sure. the, on this new album called, uh, um, it's, um, There's, I wrote down the list of some of the songs. You need to, I mean, this is what I was given. Still serving. Oh, classic. Oh, <laughs> yeah. love it. oh I you're, 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 you're going to love that song. You're Are gonna, we gonna, if you're, you're a Beach Boy fan, you're going to blow your anything? mind on that. To hear anything? You're going to treat us to, to hear the song at the end? Uh, Got to hear Hot Fun of Summertime. Uh, strange Things Happen. What's that about? Strange Thing is the new definition of a role model for a groovy chick. You know what I mean? Like, there's, 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 there's sex appeal, right? Right. No doubt about it. I mean, there, that is undeniable, and attraction is 
is something you just cannot deny. I mean, there's, there's, there's industries are based on it. But what is it, I feel like you're, what is it, what can we give this girl, what can we attribute this girl beyond sex appeal? She's got a brain and she's got a heart, and that's what strange things happen here. She was down in Rio, turned some heads of state, got him into make, got him, got him into making this world a better place. But, but, uh, but oh, on Coca, oh, Coca, Copacabana, man, does she radiate? I better go meditate. Wow, <laughs> it's like, very good. She, she's sexy, but she also is, cares about the environment. She cares about life. She's into astrology. She's into whatever it is, life, you know, like new age stuff. But she's like a, a 60s girl and she's in the 90s. And she's very attractive. Very, she's, it's like a movie. Strange things happen. And every time I'm with my baby, strange things happen. So you wrote that it's with like mystical. It's a mystical terror. new age girl that, that has a heart, cares about life, and people, animals, whatever. Cares about the environment. Has a brain, you know. Yeah. So that that strange, that's the premise of strange things happen. Yeah. That coupled with <coughs> um, summer in paradise. Now we're talking about okay, the group stands for fun, hot fun in the summertime, mm -hmm. no doubt, and still surfing. You bet your life. But uh, if you wonder what happened to Surfer Joe, he, he, he up and took a powder down to Mexico mm -hmm. with a pretty senorita we both used to know. We, we, you know. <laughs> That kind of thing. What you can see him catch a wave in the morning light, and sometimes you can find him in this board at night, a silhouette on the water as the sun dips out of sight. He still surfaces. How do you remember all these lyrics? And it's like, <laughs> when it, it starts, uh, he's always he's always catching, no, he, he's always riding sidewalks in a landlocked town, a solitary surfer still, he, got, he gets around. He has his favorite spots now where his best rides could, can be found, you know. What would the second single be off the record? An original song, I hope? I don't know. No? I don't, I don't know what the second is. You think I'm psychic or something? Yeah. Wow, you've, ah! you've been pretty psychic yeah. today. You've been pretty psychic. I just have a couple more questions. Go ahead. The last esoteric album I had to ask you about, which actually I like. It's strange. It's perverse. It's weird. What am I going to say? A later 70s album. What, what am I going to pick? Gosh, goodness golly, I wouldn't know. I'm what? picking your brain. Love you. Oh, Beach Boys love you. Yeah. I love Airplane. The yeah, song you sing, Airplane, it's beautiful chords and it great, and you sing it really well, it's a great song. What I do you like remember that about song. that album? I mean, it sounds unfinished, it sounds like almost like a demo, but that kind of appeals to me, it has like a childlike quality mm -hmm. as well. What do you recall about that record? Do you know any other songs off that? Sure, I'll Bet He's Nice. Um, Heard a lot of Johnny Carson lately. Yeah, yeah Johnny Carson, Carson Mona, <laughs> Honking Down the Highway. Mm -hmm. uh, Night was so young. It's called Solar System. Ding yeah. dang, what? Ding, ding dang, ding dang with Roger McGuinn. Hmm. That's an interesting one. Do yeah. you remember that record at all? What do mm -hmm. you remember about that? Were you happy with? It? Is that a record you look back and say, yeah, we were successful, maybe not commercially. I think there's cute things on it, but, but um, we're that was one of the last albums on Warner's, wasn't it? Yeah. And they were in a mood to promote it, so it was like almost. Yeah. yeah, the last one was uh, you, but they didn't push uh, yeah. "Love You" at all. They didn't. No, yeah. because we were at the end of it. That's well, why you signed with CBS. Yeah. yeah. See, we had already signed, and then they they just forget it. They pressed up maybe fifty thousand. So that's why it wasn't promoted. That's right. Keeping the Fairness. summer alive. What do you think of that going on? Is probably one of the best uh, song uh, later. I like the way. Uh, I like the artwork. Oh, it's kind of yeah, yeah, pretty cover. cool album cover, actually. Yeah, it's, yeah. A good one. Yeah. it's definitely not an endless summer album cover. No, much You can than tell that. who each other are much on the better cover. than that. But the song itself could have been more commercial. Had going I, on, real? No, going on. Yeah. No, I'm talking about the, the keeping the summer alive. Keeping the summer alive. Okay. That could have been much more commercial. In what way? Good going on is great. That's I what I was going to say. That's it's a great song. That's the classic yeah. song. Just, yeah, exactly. From yeah. that's Brian Wilson. I mean, see the thing is about you Brian. Brian. Well, yeah, that too. But but see, Brian is. Uh, I mean, said a lot of bad things about him, 
uh, because he stole from me. Ah. So, uh, and there's no, there's no, I mean, that's history, and that's a fact. Uh, and it will remain to be seen how it will, will, it will resolve. And, but, but even Brian, in, in his worst moments, still is Brian. He has a certain inherent nature, it, it, which is he has he has a brilliant ability with music. I wouldn't say he's brilliant with words, and that's why he's always had co-writers, and uh, with lyric, with respect to lyrics, and unfortunately, in some in some cases, not the best circumstances or people. Uh, maybe they were just kind of taking advantage of him, you know, maybe they didn't, maybe they were drug buddies. Did you like Van Dyke cases. Parks' stuff? I like Van Dyke Parks as a person, and I, at the time, I thought his, his, his l lyrics were alliterative prose, which is great, mm -hmm. in ter if you appreciated his prose and alliteration, he's brilliant. But as far as translating to mid-American commercial appeal, don't think so. Calm, calm-native ruins domino. Calm-native ruins domino. Yeah, or over and over the crow cries uncover the cornfield. You know, I mean. What's that mean? Exactly. <laughs> it, it's it's like a, it's a self-indulgent uh, sort of drug-induced. It's, it's how his Van Dyke's brain functioned with those mm. those things, you know, and, and, uh, in his system. And Br Van Dyke Parks is on this album today. I mean, he's playing the accordion and, and, and all he? that kind of Oh, yeah. He's on the new record. Oh, yeah, Someone absolutely. Paradise. He's great. He is a, one of the nicest persons in the world. And I tell him, hey, your lyrics, I thought your lyrics... <laughs> Sucked. What did he say? Does he laugh? No, I thought your their lyrics, your lyrics, Van Dyke were brilliant. Except, who the fuck knows what you're talking about? That's exactly how I talk to him, <laughs> and he and I joke about it because he has the greatest sense of humor, That's great. and he can laugh at himself and he's he can laugh musician, at the situation. He's a brilliant musician. He's he's very gifted musician. Well, you know, speaking of musicians on the new record, who else is on the new record besides the Beach Boys? Who else plays on the new record? Um, you mentioned Van Dyke Parks. Joel Peskin plays the saxophone. And, uh, and uh, you play any this sax? guy named Craig Fall playing guitar. Just beautiful guitar. He's the same guy that did uh, Somewhere in New Japan. Okay. Yeah, beautiful guitar work. Good saxophone work. Uh, we had Rod, this guy Rod, play, who played bass on Kokomo. Okay. He, he played bass and electric bass and some of the stuff. And uh, there weren't that many. Um, Carl obviously there was there's plays, a, there's right? a Sammy Marandino who was a drummer that was, that Carl recommended to to give us a little more okay. pop in the in the in the drum stuff. Mm -hmm. And he does a lot of he's a musician, a drummer out of New York, plays on a lot of a lot of sessions. Mm -hmm. so he's, and uh, Carl plays a lot of guitar on the record, right? I hope. No, no, not too not much. Really. Mm -hmm. No, he sings mainly. I mean, see, this project was done at Terry Melcher's house. Craig Fall did most all the guitars that I remember. Uh, there might be, there might have been a couple of things done by a couple other people, but uh, mainly singing, I guess. Mainly singing. Al, Carl, myself, Bruce played a little keyboard on, on like a couple of songs, but basically it was, uh, um, it was uh, mainly vocals for the Beach Boys. You can't beat that. Well, I mean, you know, what, what did you think of the 85 album titled The Beach Boys? It took a long time to get an album called The Beach Boys, but sonically, I love the sound of the record. I mean, I thought the voices were real rich, but what yes. did you think overall of the record? How do you assess well, it now? Well, it was, as you remember, that Get Your Back was the only chart record off that album. And that was, a, there was, that was clearly a case of fragmentation and it's at its most ridiculous. Not as it's most ridiculous in the, in the, in rock and roll because there are some real good ridiculous. examples of extremities. <laughs> extreme, <laughs> extreme. No, but like for instance, Landy and Brian flew off to England to to meet with the producer who had done Boy George, mm -hmm. and then Carl flew over to England. Meanwhile, Mike Love and Terry Melcher write Get You Back, 
Terry Melcher let this guy produce it where he shouldn't have. He should have produced it because Terry wanted to do it more like the E Street Band. Ooh. Guitar, you know, like a, you know, a CHR track. Yeah. If you can imagine that song with that ballsy kind of a track, it yeah. would have been a huge success. It was. It, it still was, was. It was a, a big success. It was the number one AC record for a couple of months in a row, which is, I mean, no slouch. But I still love good. it. I love yeah. it. Though. Oh, it's nice. But, but if you can listen to that next time you hear it with, with balls of a, of, of a, if it was, Bruce, if the East Street Band. Yeah, Bruce Field. Yeah. If, if it had the East Street Band plan, that if it a ballsy track, it would have been a CHR crossover. It would have been a smash. So was Steve Levine a wrong choice as producer <coughs> for the record? For the Beach Boys. For the Beach Boys. Okay. Yeah. See, do you like the record? The, it, it's a Beach Boys cannot, in my estimation, be successful with a producer simply because he's a current hot hip groovy <coughs> up-to-date producer with some credits and it's, it's way more complicated than that. The Beach Boys complexity vocally alone is a daunting prospect for most producers. Because most producers are engineers. A lot of producers are mm -hmm. engineers that with technical expertise and knowledge and maybe have the good fortune to have met the right people and yeah. become mm -hmm. rich and, and, and made a successful album or two and have a nice run with them. Uh, the, the Beach Boys are so artist self-generated yeah. by virtue history with Brian that what we have needed to become, to get successful was somebody who understands that mechanics and supplies what Brian lacks today, which is perseverance and discipline. And, and com the competitive spirit that he used to have. He still has his skills, but we haven't had access to him. So what we did is we had to find an engine to take the disparate talents of the Beach Boys and hook them up and mm -hmm. position everybody properly. And that's what we've done basically by committee between myself, Bruce, and Terry Fashion, to with Terry fashioning what he's strong as at tracks, uh, Bruce helping with vocal arrangements and stuff, Mike Love with his hooks and lyrics, and saying what songs we should and shouldn't do, and, and where I believe Carl's most uh, commercial, and where I believe Al should be coming in and make it stronger. I told Al, I mean, he, uh, we had a rough time the last couple of years communicating. Um, he's definitely been on a bummer for many years so based on some things that have happened to him historically with different than what happened to me with Brian with respect to the writing but similar effect on him emotionally and and, and me I ignore it and go straight ahead and I think more of the future but but Al has this thing that he'll he'll, he'll obsess on something that happened 20 years ago and he, he, it's hard for him to let go of it. So we've been actually having group meetings between Carl, myself, uh, Al, and uh, uh, with, with the psychiatrist, Harold Bloomfield, who's a good friend of mine and board member of the Love Foundation. And, and we've done a lot of healing kind of things, you know, airing grievances and working things out. It's been very therapeutic for all of us, individually and collectively, I think. We've understood each other, gotten to see the other person's experience and point of view, and, and it's made the group, I think, better. Because we were, we were hearing a lot of talk that Al <coughs> actually left the band at one point. Well, oh, I we, was we, we got to the point where we didn't that. even want to be in the same room or stage with oh, him because he was, so, he was so negative about certain things. And, and once we were able to get into a forum, an area where he was able to unload some of that and, mm -hmm. and we could empathize with some of it, not all of it, but in, yeah, sure. and be able to air our points of view and stuff, then, then it, it resolved a lot of that stuff. You getting along better now? Yeah, with everything? a lot better. And But the point is, he, he wasn't even on the album until a couple of months ago when we, when we finally resolved enough stuff to where, okay, great. So then he came in and I told Al, I said, Al, you made a good song great. Now, it's not that we couldn't do an album right. and do it well without mm -hmm. Al Jardine around, or about it, or the same goes for anybody. And he's, talking to the Beach Boys, you're going to get some a listen anyway. But he, on, a, on several songs, he made it, it went from good to great. 
you know, and, and with Carl, God, he is, he's, he's a monster on this album. I think he sounds phenomenal, can't best, wait. most commercial he's ever sounded. I can't wait. Can't Does he sing some lead or you guys alternate? Oh, yeah. He sings a lot, a lot of leads. Good. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Just a couple more questions. You, you've been so amazing. Give a great interview. Um, tell me a bit about... Um, Really the, the original to these guys, <laughs> these middle-aged rockers. Original, <laughs> original Beach Boys Cafe. Tell us about that, so people can check <clears> it out. What, what can people? What will it's people? It's in Hermosa Beach, okay. and it's a fun place. It's got all kinds of memorabilia around and photos Video? And, and. Any videos? Yeah, there's some videos running and stuff of different things and stuff. But it's a fun motif. It's really, it's a cute place, you know. Cars and you know, it's like, it's like the Hard Rock Cafe. Only it's the Beach Boys. What type of memorabilia that I can do <coughs> for people? Anything? Somebody's anything base, somebody's shirt. You know, I mean that same kind of stuff that you yeah. see at the Hard Rock Cafe. Striped shirts. Yeah, and maybe Ooh. posters from different concerts and places. And Did so. you like the Ameri All American Band, the uh, an American Band video? No. You mean the one Malcolm Leo yeah, himself? Right, yeah. Fuck no, hell no. Will another one be done because Did I say fuck? I'm sorry. No, well, you didn't. didn't. I didn't hear it. I the didn't tape didn't I'm, I'm glad you deleted that. <laughs> yeah. will, will you guys make another attempt at a much more definitive documentary on the band? That's something that should be done. Definitely. The book I can do without. Video However, the, a video, video documentary. And know what else would be great? Just as yes. a suggestion, maybe a, um, a video just ca calling all the promos the band you probably could put out a couple of videos of all the promos, you know, done for songs as hmm. starting maybe in the early days onward. There's so many promos of songs that well, I've actually, never seen. One of my pet projects is to do a, a, a uh, documentary on tour with America's Band starring the Beach Boys cheerleaders. Think about it for a minute. Uh, what would it be rated on? Would it be rated X, I hope? Not X, come well, on. Maybe there could be two verses. What a sleaze master you are. I mean, so I'm trying to keep this on a certain level here. No, but see, can you imagine? Okay, the backdrop is the Beach Boys music. And the story is you're on tour. But here's the girls rehearsing. Here's the girls auditioning for it. Here's the girls getting ready, getting costume fitting, fitting, fitting their costume. Interesting. You know, all this kind of stuff. Um, in the background, you hear "Don't worry, baby" going on while the girls are getting made up for "Be True to Your School," right? And the, and, and the different costume changes. Everything. I think, and, and here they are on the bus, here and there on the plane, and here they are backstage, here and on stage. And I think it'd be great because you'd see the Beach Boys experience through the eyes of these girls. Here's somebody on the phone with their boyfriend back home. Here's somebody. Bring the, you know their families to the show that they you know from Ohio or something and here they are doing a community service thing where they're honoring some kids who did some community service. It'll be good for a TV special, not That's a video though, because we would love a video of yeah. just the band because there's so much stuff and you guys must have so much stuff in the archives, visual, mm -hmm. you know, following you. And well, I'm more of, I'm more focused to be honest with getting. I'd like to get a movie done of, of uh, still surfing. Did you ever wonder what happened to Surfer Joe? You know, like <laughs> that, that's an interesting yeah. idea. Oh yeah, he uh, doesn't do a whole lot with his law degree. Played volleyball and major, majored oceanography, but he does a lot of thinking about how to save the sea. That's where the whales are. Mm. Mm. Still surfing <laughs> or Surfer Joe it could be called. <coughs> the further adventures of the Surfer Joe. The further adventures of Surfer Joe. <laughs> so, like these kids, I have a black kid, a Hispanic kid, and a little white, you know, blonde-haired kid on their skateboards, and the black kids zooming down the street in a ghetto situation. Right. Hispanic kids zooming down a barrio situation, a lot of Tienda del Café and all this kind of stuff in right. a barrio situation. And then, obviously, in, in East L.A. or Mexico, you know. And then, then this white kid in an aqueduct with the freeway overpass, and the kid's taking, the, knows the best rides, where the best rides can be found. He's like spinning out, like doing this great, thing with his skateboard and all of a sudden you see as he's doing this you see the surfer Joe and his woody with the surfboard hanging out cruising across the aqueduct right? <laughs> then, you, then you're down in Mexico where he's got his little casita on the sand with his pretty pretty mama Cita you were an ID ma I idea man oh yeah well, you're always thinking of these great yeah. these are great ideas so there's strange things happen still surfing yeah. summer in paradise 
Yep. Island fever. Hey, Doc, I need a pain reliever. Ooh, I got it bad. I got the island fever. <laughs> My baby caught it, and I'm not quite sure how. Whoa. She might have caught it from a travel brochure now. There you go. You know, that kind of thing. That's clever. That's cute. Yeah. It's cute. You know, the Beach Boys have a vast catalog of unreleased stuff, unreleased material. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even really in the Capitol CDs. There's a couple bonus tracks, but you guys have so much stuff. There's been talk Capital was putting out a, a Beach Boy box. Would you guys ever consider doing something like Dylan did? They've just started releasing some of his things. He has something called Bob Dylan, I get the bootleg series, series mm -hmm. one, volume one to three, where it's three CDs packed with stuff and it'll be a continual thing. The mm -hmm. Beach Boys, I mean, there's, there's things circulating on the market uh, for fans. There's some great mm -hmm. stuff uh, circulating and that, I'm sure, doesn't even touch the brim of what's out there. Well, ever see the light of day any of this stuff in that type of uh, installment? That's sort of like an archival kind of exercise. Yeah. Which um, there, are, I think Al Jardine might be interested in, in doing it. Yeah, getting involved in some, something like that. <clears throat> Whereas my disposition is more like, what's what can we do creatively now and in the future? Yeah. Uh, I'm not so much into the past. Yeah. Um, but just the way I, I just the way I think. Mm -hmm. Mercury and Aquarius is called. Okay. My mind, Mercury, planet Mercury governs the mental process. And Aquarius, futuristic, okay. humanitarian, futuristic, not afraid to be different. Which is probably why I said what I said for the Hall of Fame. Yeah, well, you stood up for yourself. Hey. You got some good press out of it. At least you were mentioned. Real good press. Yeah. Well, you know, All well. you need is love. Second page of the inside page. Of the I remember. Day. You yeah, know, great. lastly, the Beach Boys, that you've racked up 35 top 40 hits. Your status as legend is secured. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Riches, fame, women. A lot of women, actually. I'm very jealous. Yeah, but we're not the kiss and tell type like Julio no, no. And, that, and that nut. What's his name? And kiss. Gene Simmons. Yeah, come on. How tacky. So you mean you don't keep a list of how many? No. Okay, just kidding. Um, how do you beach, <laughs> how do you keep it fresh? You know, because a lot obviously there's certain songs you've been singing for 25 years. How do you keep it fresh? Is it the audience that revitalizes you? Do you hear different things when you when you play the songs? And what do you think about when you're singing certain songs? As long as we're rested. As long as we're rested in physiologically, or, you know, physically feeling good, it's just a nice, it's a joy to be able to do what you like to do, right? right? The minute you get run down or tired or fatigued, that's when you get stressed out, irritable, it becomes an effort, and it's like effort to, to do the show. So we're real careful about how we travel, our lifestyles, and everything like that. I meditate every day. I mean, I, if I didn't meditate, I would flip right out. I wouldn't be able to do this touring stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there'd be no way. Because, first of all, I wouldn't. I, I, it'd be too tiring. You know, but with a deep rest of meditation, it helps dissolve that fatigue and get, get you clearer so that you can enjoy activity. You're not, you're not like, held back by your own, you know, uh, biochemistry being fraught with tension and stuff. So as long as your your rest and activity factor is okay, then you enjoy what you're doing. So when you're doing a song that is pretty neat song, you know that like as you point out was a big hit, and people love it, and you're getting some kind of recognition, which is a good for your ego, b feels good to get that kind of recognition, and you see the enjoyment it brings to people. I mean, it's not such a bad thing to be doing, right? I mean, you're getting paid, you're, you're traveling around, you're creating sattva. <laughs> so what's so bad? The, the, the only uh, constraints I felt is in, as an individual is I don't think the Beach Boys' celebrity and, and influence has been felt profoundly enough in the... In the in, in, um, in the area of of uh, social mm -hmm. socially uplifting efforts. Yeah. Well, you guys have done so much, and you personally with the Love Foundation Project Teach. And yeah, true. We've we've made attempts to do things, but not not to any degree that's. Um, it's, I have a basic premise, which is a challenge to myself and other people. If 
if if there is so much intelligence in the world with all the universities, people with a couple of PhDs, there's some so much uh, creativity and so so much intelligence in the world. Well, if there's so much creativity and intelligence in the world, then why is there ignorance? You know, why isn't there a plan to eradicate ignorance, starvation, mm -hmm. all the violations of natural law? So, guess what? Doesn't matter how many colleges you have. Doesn't matter how many PhDs you have. If you're going to allow such terrible problems to exist in the planet, same thing I have to say about rich people having wealth. If you're so wealthy, there's nobody really truly wealthy enough in the world. Because if there were, there wouldn't be any poverty. They'd pay for it out of petty cash. That's true. They'd clear it up because they wouldn't like the sight of it. So there's either there's nobody smart enough, or not enough smart people, or there's not enough wealthy people, and there's certainly not enough caring and compassionate people. So I include my and that and the, the rest of the Beach Boys and everybody within listening distance, is it, it should be, your life should not be just self-satisfaction, you've got enough money and that's it. Or you're smart and you've got your thing together and your family's okay and that's it. Because we are all interdependent and connected whether we like it or not. And the environment's proven that to us and it's gonna, Mother Nature's going to prove it to us way big time, real strongly here in the next few years with some dramatic stuff. And so I just think, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon everyone to, to do more and challenge themselves more to do more. And, and, and that's what I mean by the Beach Boys having had a profound effect in social uplifting beneficial uh, ways that, as to what where we should be or could be or could have been or ought to be so I mean but that's that's just what we have to do from now on you know and that's why summer in paradise has that thought in in the in the, in, in the lyrics and strange things happen has that thought in it you know, still not giving up on our on our basic premise of enjoying life, because forget that. <laughs> I'm not into that. <laughs> that has some heat in so, Exactly. So we're going to have hot fun in the summertime, no doubt. But then we might want to say on a PSA, hot fun, safe sun. You know, put on that or old skin block. Put on that old. Well, safe sex is we're not we're not we're not dealing with that in this album. However, strange things happen. Yeah, you're attracted to this girl, but she's got a brain, she's got a heart. I think if you have intelligence, that'll take care of itself. That's attractive in itself. Yeah. You know, last question is which for the one show we do for NBC, <coughs> the syndicated show. It's been almost 10 years since Dennis passed away, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to have a comment on how you remember your fondest recollections of Dennis. Any fun stories you want to share? My fondest uh, recollections of Dennis were, would be at the Sacramento Civic Auditorium playing the drums and beating the hell out of them. And <laughs> And having screams that were at least as loud, if not louder, than the Beatles ever got, because he was so charismatic and so uh, appealing to those young girls. And he was like the sex symbol of the Beach Boys. And he was very dynamic, very healthy, very powerful drummer, not finesse, but just raw power. And also, just uh, as far as a person, he would, you know, he was very generous to. To, to everybody, you know, and, and uh, had a lot of spirit and energy. Unfortunately, he got into alcohol and drugs and became addicted, and it, and it ruined his life, took his life ultimately, but, and in the process, he was not enjoyable to be with in his last few years because of that, and we had problems that arose from the alcoholism, and, and its influence it had on his drumming, which had which had the obvious impact on the group in terms of performance. So we were forced to do things with him because he was just committed to his addictions and would would not get up off him, even though we tried to force him to. He was committed to it, which is very unfortunate. But but as far as his essential nature uh, was, it was just. Uh, a lot of raw power and energy and charisma, that, and, and uh, he had a big heart. And, and uh, you know, way back in the early days, we used to go fishing together, and that's when we first talked about doing a surfing song. You know, we were on the Redondo Beach breakwater fishing. You know, we'd go out like five, six in the morning, go fishing, and then we'd talk about girls and 
and we ought to do a surfing record. And we went back and talked to Brian, hey, you know. And then we, I, I wrote like 90% of surfing. Wow. And, and then surfing so far, and then surfing USA, which I wasn't credited on surfing USA either. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Was, that. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's wrote, a big one. Yeah, it's a big one. I, I'm aware that it's a big one. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> You know the other thing about Dennis, though, he wrote some great songs, and I love Pacific Ocean Blue. Mm -hmm. Do you like that record? Do you like what he did with that? It's very <coughs> well, different. Dennis's from the style of, of, of writing was was a kind of like so subjective. It wasn't. See, I am more objective with in the direction of how do we relate to the masses. How do we take a concept such as good vibrations, which was ethereal and avant in 1966, and make it so that it's not going to just be sell 10,000 singles and be on 50,000 albums? How can we get it so we get the concept across, but in terminology that relates to enough people where it'd be commercially viable and acceptable and performed and on radio and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and that's where I just came, I, I came up with, I'm picking up good vibrations, she's giving me excitation. I mean, boy-girl connection, yes, vibrations, however, it wasn't just woo, scary stuff, weird stuff, it was, yeah, okay, boy-girl. Now, now, most people can relate to that. And, and, and what happened was it was a big, huge, multi-million, you know, I mean, a million yeah. seller. So you think Dennis was more... Dennis that? was doesn't think like that, and I, it would have been... It, and he also would go along a certain track, but then he'd change it up. I think he heard Brian change up things, and he tried to emulate Brian's style. Right. We're talking about music, good vibrations, and... Well, Brian did some changes, which were very uh, interesting creative changes. Mm -hmm. I thought Dennis's changes were more indulgent, self-indulgent, or self, or, or subjective, mm -hmm. rather than purely creative, like Bryant. I think he was trying to emulate his brother rather than, you know, a, a, in terms of a style, rather than. You know, I mean, and then it's everybody's. Uh, value judgment of whether the song is good or not or whatever, but that he definitely did come up with some good melodies and and, and great moments and you know, he had he had he had stuff in him, but he was not verbally as facile as as you know, he was kinda in between Brian and, and and myself or something. He was he wasn't quite comfortable with words. He's more into feelings, and because in the feelings was his strong suit. I think. Have you tried to encourage Carl to write? Because he hasn't been writing much in that scene. No, he's been writing lately with Jerry Beckley and Bobby Lamb. They're oh, doing is that a project. Happen? What's going to happen with that? I think they're going to start recording this fall and winter. So. Does it come under one of their specific names, or is it a group? I don't know. That would be interesting because you guys did stuff with Chicago. I mean, Beach Chicago Court. Uh, tour. Yeah. There were two great tours in the 70s. Yeah. And the, and the, and the, yeah, yeah, 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. Thank you so right. much. It's been a pleasure. Do you want to do a quick ID for Wolfman? Wolfman uh, Jack? Quick. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. No, 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 no. He married me once. Did he? Oh, yeah. Really? yeah. Just hi, this is just a generic one. Hi, this is Mike.